Hey, happy Monday morning. Look who look the cat dragged in here. The the man, the myth. <laughs> be, be careful now. <laughs> Both of the, our wives are out there. You can tell the truth. <laughs> hey, how you doing? Hey, you want to join us? Oh, sure you do. Everybody loves you. I tried to get Cynthia on, didn't work. I couldn't get her out of the car. <laughs> Uh, hey, it's awesome to see you. Okay, so we have this uh, uh, incredibly wonderful guest uh, join us today. Now, when he was on, when he was in the house two years ago, we went through his testimony, uh, how he came into grace, uh, years of, in the ministry. I think last year we talked a lot about the uh, history of Shorewood and North Shore and O'Hare. So I thought today we might just have a kind of open forum with Pastor Jordan and do some Bible talk. And uh, so if you have any questions uh, for Pastor Jordan, put it in the live chat. Have anything you want to say to him. Today's all about you getting a chance to interact with, with him. How you doing, man? Okay. <laughs> you, Happy in the Lord. I, ha I have something interesting to show you, Pastor. Now, let me see here. Let me see if I can get this up here. Uh, now, on our church, on our, here we go, on our channel, we've got... Let's see, six videos that cross 50,000 views, and you're, you're one of them. You're at 58. Wow. Uh, and we've got, we've got, got 40-some videos that cross 10,000. But you have a video, you probably know this, that blows all of this away with a, arguably one of the most viewed videos in the history of the Grace Movement, probably, uh, you know what you know what video that is? The one about tithing. Tithing, yeah. Uh, it's hilarious. Uh, let me see here. I, I looked at I looked up last night uh, what the count is on this. Look at this thing. Okay, so this is a video tithing. You do not need to give ten percent to the church <laughs> from one of your grace uh, uh, programs. Three hundred and fifty-four thousand views. That's, That's unbelievable. Shows you what people are interested in. <laughs> <laughs> and to shows you the value of grace also. Yeah. You know, well, right that, division helps. Yes. So it can save you some money in the wrong places. <laughs> yeah. We we love uh, we we love talking about tithing. Uh, Mike saw that and he's like, we need to do the next ten podcasts need to be all about tithing. Maybe we can <laughs> get, get, get you some down. numbers you, right. You can go viral that way. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I had one I wanted to show you. I mentioned to you the other day. We have such a wonderful group of people that work with us uh, in our ministry. And the ladies that answer the phone, we have a series of uh, our, our 800 number. Of course, I'm on the radio six days and week in Chicago. We have the TV. We have radio around the country, plus the, the, the other ministries that, that draw people. And there's there's a group of ladies. Ray Keeble is the dean yeah. of the school. Ray, know, Ray. Ray Ray and Debbie run the office. Okay. And uh, when you call, you used to get Ray. Now you more get Debbie. Mm -hmm. But um, Charlotte and Carrie and some of the ladies that, that answer the phone, and they're really good Bible students. They they and they love what they do, and they love people, and they call and talking with them, and. I don't know how to get this to you, but there's this little, little, little blurb. Somebody, I, I just came. Somebody sent me this. Actually, they talked to Charlotte, and they sent me this, oh, the, yeah, the, yeah, this yeah, thing. Yeah. I don't. If I could send um, it to you, you could put it up. People yeah. could see it. <clears throat> but this little gal is answering. Can I really be forgiven for that? Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can. <laughs> and and you you see the eye the eye roll that she does, and the impossibility of you know. Oh, what kind of questions are that? And that's the kind of questions that, that we get. Charlotte, last week before last, what is this, last Sunday, which would be a week ago, she, she's talking to a, a Mormon guy that had gotten saved, talking to her on the phone. He's, he was tired of his, uh, he said his religion wore him out. And an, an, an Amish family that, in fact, the, the Mormon guy sent an application for Grace School of the Bible. The, an Amish family, and the, these gals just share the gospel with them, and you know, and write division and so forth. But this little, this, this little funny, I showed, I sent it to Charlotte. I said, "This, this is you." <laughs> um, I'll bet you I can. 
Yeah, you can find it somewhere. Find it here. I found the channel. Um, yeah, this lady answering all these questions. When she gets to the end of it, she takes her headphones off and she looks at the guy next to her and she says, I need a raise. <laughs> That's the I've heard enormous things about Debbie. Uh, she is, uh, I don't think I've met her, but I know she's fantastic. I've heard nothing but praise about her. Um, yeah, what we do with, with Grace School of the Bible and all the ministry really, without Ray and Debbie, frankly, just... It's like at the church without Alex, it wouldn't work. And without yeah. Ray and Debbie, the school wouldn't work. Yeah. So and I love me some Alex, too. I'm just the figurehead. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So if you're out there, if uh, we've got Pastor Richard Jordan here with us, uh, I think uh, we've got a third seat here. Hal's going to join us when he's done with his uh, doctor's appointment. And uh, so if you have any questions, you have anything you want to say to Pastor Jordan, uh, put it in the live chat. And look at this. We've already, Joyce. She's been with us uh, for a little while now. She says, yeah, i uh, so excited for this one. I'm so thankful for Pastor Jordan's messages. He helped me grow in grace. A wonderful teacher. Yeah, well, wonderful pray, teacher. Praise the Lord for the message. It, it wouldn't be much of a good teacher if it wasn't what he's teaching about. Yeah, it's it's kind of hard to not get excited about it. We we often say here, you know, the thing about grace is just it's better news than anything you're going to hear in denominational circles, in any kind of religion. It's so much better than anything. The truth is great news. Yep. Um, it's better than anything you're going to hear on the TV in the world, too, so. You ever had a, uh, do you ever get um, uh, notes on statistics for the TV program, like how many views you get, that sort of thing? I mean, did you ever have a TV program that would actually match that YouTube video that you, that's, that everybody loves? Do you know? Yeah, I have no idea. Yeah. I, don't, I don't see that kind of stuff. The, the, the forgotten truth, and the, this is the way our ministry has always been. Before we moved to where we're sure it is now, 20 years ago, we were in bedrooms and garages and attics and stuff, basements. Now we have a facility where we kind of gather together, but we're still in bedrooms, attics, and basements. Yeah, the ladies yeah. that answer the phone are all at home. Yeah. You know, before. The television's that way, too. Brother Bruchet in, in Warren, Michigan, Grace Bible Church, Warren, mm. that's where the TV is. And the, the assembly there, the people that work, answer the phone, do all the, the things, produce the TV program are there in that assembly. Mm. And for all those three decades, I would drive up, drive or fly up there. Mm. I'm a two million mile on American Airlines, mainly because I'm going to Detroit once a month. And they do those things. So I, I go and I'm the pretty face makes the program and they do all the work. <laughs> and that's, you know, I, someone sent me maybe three weeks ago, an old television program made 1990. Okay. It was, I did a series back when the, the Iraqi war started mm -hmm. called ancient Babylon and modern Iraq. Really? I, yeah. I did the series at, at, at Shorewood and we made a, uh, an album of it and, and put that, that out. Well, I did the, I did condensed version of it on TV. So somebody recently found it and sent it to me and I'm, Ever how old it was when I was in 1990, which is a lot younger. By the way, I'm 76, not 74. <laughs> My wife said I'm supposed to, I'm, I'm supposed to announce yeah. that. Uh, he, he, yeah, Jordan mentioned uh, in a, a Friday night that he was 74, and then after his everyone Cynthia's like, "No, you're 76." Yeah. I'm, <laughs> so, but ever, ever how old I was then, it's kind of embarrassing to look at it, but uh, it was fascinating to see. And it had, it had, you know, on YouTube you can see. But it's like like at, at Shorewood, if you, you look at YouTube and see there's 100 views, we'll have six or 800 on our, we do it in-house. Uh, yeah, right. So right. immediately the, the, the numbers, and then we have three different platforms. So I, I, it's hard. And, uh, the and numbers the for us, I, you know, it's, and I, I don't, I, we're not patting ourselves on the back about those numbers. I think at the time, you, the algorithms were just really friendly to us because we didn't screw up too badly. <laughs> Uh, but the YouTube has since taken down a couple of, of our videos. We had expressed concerns about the medical stabbies, you know, and a few other things. So YouTube wasn't too really happy about that. So we've already lost two videos on that. And so I don't think the algorithms are as friendly as you, we, they used to be. Uh, but in any event, um, 
The other question before we get into the live chat, the other question I wanted to ask you was that you had mentioned recently, and I can't remember if this was on the over the over the weekend or if this was at Shorewood recently, but you were thinking about were you thinking about doing a book on Romans, putting together a commentary on Romans? You were talking about a title. Yeah, I'm, I'm and you were thinking about it. I'm going to start teaching Romans Sunday mornings at Shorewood. Yes, the latter part of this month. And I'll probably be doing that till I go to heaven. Well, I think uh, that those PDFs with the Grace School of the Bible on Romans, what, five or six of them, that series, that that would also be, I think, a great addition to But just get, get an editor, just clean it up uh, well, we, and uh, we, turn we, it into a book. That's what we did with the commentary on Daniel. Right. It, it's the class, but it's it's edited and uh, for reading and for publication. Mm -hmm. And we, I, I have actually, if you in the school, all the classes, we have transcripts for all of them. Mm. The raw transcripts because the, the students are watching and they're reading what, what's there. Yeah. And I did that because several years ago, and, and here again, there are ladies, Rita Bouchard, Beverly Pratt, all kind of ladies out there that if I start naming some, I, there's no way to get this half, there's probably six or eight through the years who've done these transcripts. And I mean, from back in the nineties, been doing them and they all over the country and including I, this church, I'm happy to say. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason that I finally said we need have, the students need to have transcripts while watching the video is because I discovered that some of them were taking bad notes, you have a test and they'd answer the question wrong. And, and that's it. But that's what you taught in the class. I said, no, I didn't teach that. <laughs> They yeah. said, well, here's my notes. Yeah. And they'd say, you'd say something that leave the no out or that put it. <laughs> yeah. So I yeah. said, well, okay, now you've got, now you've got the, the notes that are. Well, I've seen, I've seen all the videos. There are playlists on YouTube of Grace School, the Bible, all the, all the classes and, and stuff. I didn't, and we didn't put any of that up. No, no, I didn't. <laughs> I didn't think you did. And um, you can get transcripts now uh, off yeah. of YouTube for all of that if you really yeah. want them. Yeah, they're, mur they're murder, but you, you can do it. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're, they're yeah. unedited. These transcripts that we have slowly have been edited for, you know, better reading. One of the problems with it, with the school transcripts, if you're not looking at the class, is that when I start a class, I'll do a little review. Maybe if I'm doing something on the board, it makes no sense in the, in, the, in the transcript. So you got to yeah. take that out and edit oh, that down. Yeah, yeah. So that that's the the biggest challenge in editing the transcripts is to be able to uh, get a what in the world is he talking? Oh, he's drawing on the board. You know, right. so you say this right. over here yeah. and that over there. Yeah, that so, makes sense. So that that's but. Eventually, it comes to me after the ladies have done. Now, Grace School of the Bible, you're, I would imagine you're probably still really happy with the totality of content that you have in the school. Have you ever thought about anything that you wanted to change? Have you changed your mind on anything over the years? Pretty much leave everything as is? Or? Uh, occasionally, I disagree with myself. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I talked to you the other night about preaching. Yeah, teaching like that is a, it's a it's a moment, and you would you can't you can't just go recite the the transcripts and have the same same dynamic spiritual dynamic that's there, and the idea of having to uh, uh, the idea of redoing all of that is is there's no way to duplicate what we did. Right, the guys that wanted to study the the training and so forth at the time and the 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 environment in which we did it was very unique, and that's where the Frankly, from my view, that's where the, the effectiveness has come from because we've grown from there to here, but that's the foundation. And when people come in, we get people, we get two to four new students a week. So we're not, we're not getting thousands of students, but, but we don't advertise. We don't do it. It's word of mouth advertising. Mm. And we get, you know, two to four students a week from all kinds of things. It's Mormon family, Amish people. You say, well, that's, that's, in, they're going to have fun. <laughs> they're going to love the liberties we have in Christ. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> a lot, a lot of people from charismatic backgrounds yep. and so forth. And people that, you know, are trying to, and most of our students are in the 25 to 50 range, age range. They're out of high school or out of college. They're, they've got a little experience in life. They realize, hey, we, there's something missing. We need it. And then we got a bunch of people in their 70s. This this, this uh, Mormon guy, he's in his 70s. And you say, wow. 
So you, I, I can't I, imagine what the transition must be to go from Mormon to Grace. That's yeah, unbelievable. He had a great. It, it was a great statement. Saying, My religion wore me out. <laughs> <laughs> and he heard. He heard. Or I, actually, heard the radio. And I don't. I don't know too much about the Mormons. I, I'm guessing it's got to be a workspace sort of thing, and uh, oh, yeah. which had to have exhausted a man by the time he became seventy. That's amazing. You have to have a works program to build those big buildings they have. That's right. That's right. The um, Would you say the majority of people uh, who do this school, they're oftentimes just doing it for themselves, for their own personal growth and edification? Or uh, do you have... Uh, Probably about half, half of the students we have now come in. It's designed to train you for the work of the ministry, it, not necessarily to preach, but for you to do the work of the ministry that you want to do as an edified believer. The whole purpose of the school is to bring bring the guys up to the point of edification, maturity. Mm. Follow Paul's design for edification. That's right. why the curriculum is different than anything else. And I mean, I just when Ted Fellows and Chuck Wiltshire came to me separately and said, "We'd like to preach. Would you train us?" And I we talked, and I said, "All I'll do for you what I did for myself. That's mm. if that's I'm not going to do the other stuff." And that was what they wanted. So we did that and followed the, the edification. It took me seven years for myself. And I said, cram it into three for them because I understood how to do it. Mm. But, uh, and the, you know, the um, results speak for themselves for good or bad. And I know I would never be able to reproduce it. I've thought about there are some things that I would clean up in the Daniel commentary. I changed, I, you know, I, Few things here and there. I knew yeah. some things now that I that I thought then, but wasn't sure about. Yep. And yeah, you, you clean it up. And if I did Romans, I would. There's things in it that I know better now. I um, well, even but even back then, I remember going through. I mean, one of the big things for me was Romans six, and I mean, even back then, you totally got our identification. You didn't hammer people over the head, kind of like the way we do it. Uh, but uh, and it was and the whole thing was beautiful. And it was just like, well, yeah, this is. You know clearly the way this is the way it is, and uh, you just kind of taught it straight, and it was good. And it was, I uh, really, I really love that section. Yeah, well, um, Romans, so, Romans, Romans 3, justification, Romans 6, your identification, and Romans 12, let's get on with a program, right? Division, right? Those three, well, those three chapters to me, you know, are the, are the key launch pads. And I, uh, Romans 6 has always been since I was a young believer critically important. I never, I, when I grew up in grace, I always knew Romans 6, 3, and 4 was, it was spiritual, but I, I knew that it wasn't water, but I didn't know what it meant to, for it to be spiritual. Like it never clicked with me to think about, okay, I know what it is. And so what is it, you know? And it never, it never, never registered with me until after I, I came back in 2014. Yeah. Um, well, and that's, that's what gets you back. That's what, that's the, the missing element. Um, Brother Lange used to say, Roy Lange in Mobile was my pastor. And I, when I got saved, I started studying with him. And within, I was in January, by August, I'd read Paul's epistles through about three dozen times. I'd read everything Mr. Stan, Mr. Becker, O'Hare. He, Roy had this big bookstore. And I just consumed it because that's all I wanted to do. And I remember sitting with Brother Lange in his office and saying, What's next? <laughs> he, and he and he he began to he shared with me yeah some of the like some yeah. of the, the 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 growth issues and i said well why aren't we getting this at church he says well you got to understand ricky the folks that are get, coming in at church they're older and they learn slower than you do <laughs> <laughs> yeah so i i actually learned instead of brother Lange in his office more than at the church because he's teaching to people and I, I had not that I'm smarter than them, I just kind of grown beyond where they were at the time yeah. back in the, before I, this is back before I could drive. Yeah. I, I was, I played the organ for the youth choir yep. at 830, yep. 830, go to Sunday school. Then my dad would take me over to brother Lange's church for church. And then there's a family in the church there that live close to where they'd bring me home. Well, they were an older couple. And as we'd come home, I'd listen to them marvel about learning about right division, the Paul and the distinctions that right division were making. And so I'd understood the value that they were getting out of it. But like I said, I'm I'm sitting in the back seat thinking, man, you guys need to get on with this stuff. 
I, I probably asked this a couple of years ago, but I'm, I'm curious, what, what was your dad's thoughts about you studying with Roy and, and uh, getting involved in ministry like that? He, he was a good dad. He loved me and he supported anything that I did. But his view was you know, we left the Methodist church because the Methodist church assigns you a pastor. And the brother Edmonds, the pastor was there when I got saved. He was he preached the gospel, and yeah. He, but the next guy, he, the, the first Christmas he was there, stood up in the in the in the lectern reading the scriptures and says, "Now I want you to understand, I don't believe this mythological stuff about a virgin birth." Oh. Church six hundred people. Oh. Go, oh. Next two weeks later, there's a hundred people there. Yeah, yeah. And my dad wasn't one of them. Yeah. He, he said, "We're never going to a church where God does yeah. that." They tried to get rid of the guy, they couldn't. So, a bunch of people left and started an independent yeah. church but my dad around the corner from us it was a, a zion baptist church where my uncle was a pastor and dad said we'll go around to jim's place right he, and because he preaches good and he did he's an acts two dispensational premillennial rapture pre-trip rapture guy and i said but i want to go to brother Langy's church he, and he said you want to preach right i said yeah <laughs> he said you'll never make a living yeah in a little church like that yeah you would go around to Jim's church. He, and I said, but I'm, I'm not a Baptist dad. He said, but you'll never make a living out there. Yeah. And that was, I had started working at the rescue mission. Yeah. I was a junior in high school. I was a sophomore and between sophomore and junior year. I actually worked at the mission in the summertime. So that's what saved me having to become a Baptist. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because I had the opportunity to, yeah. to work there. And okay, and my dad was looking out for the best of me. He didn't understand the the, the doctrinal stuff so much, and and, and actually never did. He, uh, he he used to say, "I'm more secure than the Baptists think they are," because Methodists believe you can lose your salvation. He didn't believe he could lose his salvation unless he unless you quit believing. Mm. And people say, "Well, how much sin, how much sin do you have to do to lose your salvation?" My dad would say, "I'm I'm saved because I believe. And if mm -hmm. I quit believing, yeah, then I and I yeah. he, the verse that changed his mind was Second Timothy. Timothy two. I was about to say yeah. Second Timothy two, the faithful saying number yeah. three. Yeah. yeah. So, and and he he rejoiced in that and saw that and that that actually helped me get a little bit of uh, credibility with yeah. him to to what I'm doing is not quite so yeah. scary. Yeah. Every time I prep for a podcast and I see an article about the Methodist Church today, I think of you often and how it is so diametrically opposed to anything it was back in your day. Yeah. It's unbelievable. And in fact, you were like mentioning, um, I think it was Friday night, you're talking about uh, the way people were reacting to Matthew 15 and the Syrophoenician woman. I mean, the the product, the uh, like the Presbyterians, the Lutherans, the Methodists. You know, they are now openly critical of the things Jesus says. They they lose their minds when he says dog in Matthew 15. Yeah. You know, they, there was a Methodist guy the other uh, just last week. I never talked about it was talking about how, you know, when the the wedding, the parable of the wedding feast in Matthew 22 and the guy that wasn't wearing the wedding ceremony clothes that the that he should have been wearing. And so basically showed up in his own self-righteousness. And he's like. This is just, a, I mean, what Jesus taught is this is not my kingdom. He's not my Messiah. This is just, I can't believe he said this, you know. Well, he's right. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> so, um, uh, but yeah, uh, the, the Methodists are unbelievable. And people are just openly critical of the things Jesus says now. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing. Uh, well, uh, you, you have to. The Methodist Church I was a part of became the United Methodist Church, and that's where the liberal guy came from. And so there are Methodisms like, you know, there's 400 different kind of Baptists, there's about 30 different kind of Methodists, and there are some Bible Methodists around. And uh, so they had a, I, if I'm not, there's a lot of Methodists breaking off, and one because they wanted to stick with a lot of biblical truths. Uh, so I give them, I'll give them credit for that at least. Um, the now. The first questions we Bible questions we got for Pastor Jordan here came from Amy Stewart. Uh, she's a sweet sister, goes to Brian's church. Uh, so I love to say if Amy says anything wrong, it's always Brian's fault, not Amy's. We all agree with that. <laughs> uh, all right. So she had a list of questions. Not, uh, the, naturally, the first she goes one. To Brian's church, sure she does. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Anybody going to Brian's church, she would have a whole bunch of questions. And they're all think. written out. 
Who's that over there? Is that Freddy Bear? Hey, why don't you come on up, Fred? Why don't you join us? I didn't know you were back there. You done with the done with the doctor's appointment? Come on, Fred. Can you walk that far? Yeah, he's got to come over through the side. We just got to be careful of the cords there. Um, is Hal going to make? I have not heard yet from Hal. The the thinking is is well, we Fred was with you the first year. Mike was with you last year. We were going to have Hal join you uh, this year after the doctor's appointment. But come on, Fred. It's no great loss. Yeah. Um, you know, it's a really pretty day outside. Great day yeah. for a boat ride. Wonderful day for a boat ride. <laughs> Turned out well, didn't it? Ironically so enough. Far. Like, so far. Par for the course this weekend. Yeah. <laughs> hey, it's good to see you. The doctor give you the okay? Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know how they are. <laughs> <laughs> they don't want to give you too much of an okay because then you'd say, well, why do I need to come back? <laughs> exactly. Just give me the credit card as you go out the door. Yes. All right, so we're going to do some Bible questions here. First one, uh, Amy's question was, during Christ's earthly ministry, was the population of Galilee primarily Gentile? Uh, so um, the, the uh, and I, I did a, um, I could show a map of Galilee. Uh, here, let me see here. This is uh, from uh, uh, the... Uh, image page on Google, Galilee in the time of Jesus. You can see most of these. This is, uh, I'll just take, pick this one here. This is a Galilee. It's west of the the, the Sea of Galilee. Um, almost reaches out to the Mediterranean Sea. Of course, you have Nazareth in there. It's a big, a pretty big region with a lot of, a lot of kind of uh, famous towns. So I I'm guessing my answer would be probably uh, mostly there were some, probably some Gentiles in there, but mostly Jews in Galilee. Would you think? It's referred to as Galilee of the Gentiles. Oh, but I don't, I don't know how much how many uh, Gentiles were there. Um, there's a lot of these towns here that. Uh, so it, well, I could be wrong. Um, I'm not. You, what did you all say? That, all that familiar with what, the what, history what, of Galilee? What, what, what did you just say? She said that they were. He you just they said you could be wrong. Yes. <laughs> no, I'm, you, I'm usually wrong. Maybe I should oh, say it that way. <laughs> I, always I, was, I was shocked at such a casual admission. <laughs> oh, believe you say, me, it's a some it's, things just go without saying. Yeah, but, uh, it's almost <laughs> daily. Yeah, uh, but the question is: During Christ's earthly ministry, was the population of Galilee primarily Gentile? I'd say yes. Uh, Jordan says yes. Uh, here's another question. Any thoughts on whether or not the... I'd say that based on Matthew 4, verse 15. Okay. Where well, he's we... quoting Isaiah, the land of Zebulun, the land of Nephilim, by the way of the sea, beyond Jordan, Galilee, the Gentiles. Oh, uh, there you go. He had turned it... In other words, they had, they had filled up that part of the world. He mm. took it... They took... They deported it, the, the northern kingdom. Mm. And the, the Gentiles had come and taken it over. Um... The next question is, any thoughts on whether or not the Antichrist will do more miracles than what Christ did during his earthly ministry? <laughs> now, I remember um, I did on Wednesday nights, End of the World in Chronological Order, and I remember quoting Jordan. Um, I quoted Jordan on the Antichrist. He, I remember, I think it might have been in the book of Daniel, where... Um, Oops. I think Jordan said that the Antichrist, there's like 18 types in the Bible. and uh, 18 types of Christ. 18 types of, of the Antichrist. Yeah, and 21 and then Christ. Yeah, and then, he, then he says, well, you know what that is? 666. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I don't know. Hard to say. Probably just guessing there. Um, the Lord had three and a half years. I don't think the Antichrist is going to be doing much in the way of miracles in the last three and a half years of the tribulation. So maybe close. That's when he'll do the miracles. Okay. Um, um, all right. Well, you want to elaborate on that? When the, Okay. So I, the last I, half I, is when the Antichrist would, is going to I do would miracles? I would suggest you ask her pastor at home. Yeah. All right. Uh, now no, the other I, I don't have any. The other questions uh, have to do with John 8. Um, I've done a couple of sermons on John 8. I actually love this chapter. Uh, John 8, and of course the, the big question here would be verse uh, 44. 
Uh, John 8, 44. Ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. Of course, the questions here are... Um, when he, uh, the devil was a murderer from the beginning, who did he murder? Now, I remember when I preached on it years ago, I, I remember, I, I really like what Bollinger said. He said that he, he thought it was in the beginning of the human race. And basically the people he wanted to murder was us. <laughs> and then in the garden, you had um, essentially Lucifer wanting to uh, have man come unto judgment and God taking him out for disobeying him. Um, I know that in the context, he's talking to the Pharisees, uh, and I've, I have talked about murderous intent, like the Pharisees. Uh, you have any thoughts on that, Pastor? Well, it, I, you know, the, the when it says the beginning, I, it would have to be the beginning of when sin started, because that's what's in the passage. Your, your father, uh, he was a murderer, a killer. The wage of sin is death. From the beginning, well, I had that wasn't his beginning of creation. It's, it's the beginning when he be, develops the lie program. He abode not the truth mm. because there's no truth in him. So I'd say that the murdering was the, the wage of sin is death. First uh, John three fifteen he says, "Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murder hath eternal life abiding in him." So, you know, I don't think he took a gun out and shot somebody. He developed a program that kills people. Um, I know the Calvinists, I'm sure, would probably love this, use this verse to try to claim that Christ or God created evil and created Satan to be the way that we know him now. But, um, Christ, but he says at the end of the verse, when, when he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own. He didn't, he did not tell you what God told him to tell you. Mm hmm. He, yeah. he created, he's a liar and he's a liar and the father of it. And that's the reason I said the beginning there, I'd I, I take to be when he, when he gave birth to the lie. I love that. I love that. I think that's great. Uh, he abode not in the truth. Was he at one time abiding in the truth? Yeah. 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 I, yeah he had, God gave him the truth. He had, he had, he had a position only second to the Godhead. And he knew what God's plan and purpose for creation was. That's why he desired it. Um, um, the uh, because there is no truth in him was that uh, has that always been the case, or was he initially an innocent, truthful creature? Uh, no. If if he's the father of of the lie, then the truth would have been there, and then he can, he gave birth to the lie, so the lie wasn't always in him. Um, probably after he succumbed to his own pride yeah. and uh, began to lie to himself. You know, there's a, there's a branch of philosophy in theology called, that, called theodicy, which is the study of the question, how can a benevolent God accept sin and the, what sin brings? And when you study that, and the, this is one of these topics that we never talk about, but I'm studying, I'm teaching Ezekiel 36. And when it talks about, I'm going to put, put my law in your heart to cause you to walk in. That's not an automatic kind of thing like that. Mm -hmm. There's a process in, involved in that. Mm -hmm. And yeah. I've been trying to figure out how to teach that because that's misunderstood a great deal. And, and it comes to the question about how do you know in eternity, you aren't, you're never going to choose to sin. I mean, here's Satan, here's Lucifer. He didn't have an old sin nature. And yet he made a choice. Here's God himself, the triune Godhead. They have total freedom. Never have they chosen to rebel against one another. So there's that, that freedom, that free will, we call it, that's, that's there. So how is it that you know that you're never going to, you say, well, we have a new nature 
and that 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 never. But these guys didn't have a sin nature either. And I've come to the conclusion that there's going to be an understanding that you're going to have your your mindset, the mind of Christ. You'll think like the Godhead never thinks about living for them, themselves. They're so thoroughly invested in living for each other. Love. Mm-hmm. God is love. Yeah. God is living and works no ill for his neighbor. And you're going to have that complete, total freedom that says you could, but I'd never choose it because it would never be the best thing. The um, I remember uh, going through the kingdom, and one of the questions I had, well, these kingdom saints, how is it they're, they're going to be surrounded by these Gentiles, many of whom are still in the flesh and unsaved, and surely they're going to try to tempt them, and none of them are going to even think twice about it. Yeah, been there, done that, not going back, maybe. <laughs> At the end of Ezekiel 36, when he talks about what they're going to do, you're going to be like the Garden of Eden. They're going to be able to think like God originally thought about creation. And at the end of the chapter, he says, they're going to ask God to do for the Gentiles what he's done for them. Right. And mm-hmm. you say, whoa. Now, see, that that's that thinking process. And again, that's not a, we're not, we're not going to be robots that can't do something. We're going to be free living agents who choose to serve God because we choose him, the value in, that we see and understand in him. And to me, that when you, when you do the Calvinism stuff, you lose all of that. You know, you get the security, well, there'll never, they'll never be a problem, but you're also a robot because you can't do something. I remember anyway that that's enough to get me in bad trouble right there. So. <laughs> Praise <laughs> Lord. Keep, one it, of my, keep th- it going. Thank you for that. I remember one of my uh verse that floored me when I was going studying the kingdom was Isaiah 51 3. For the Lord shall comfort Zion, he will comfort all her waste places, and he will make her wilderness like Eden. And her desert, like the garden of God, joy and gladness shall be found therein, thanksgiving and the voice of melody. And then there is um, Ezekiel 36, 35. And they shall say, this land that was desolate is become like the garden of Eden. And the waste and desolate and ruined cities are become fenced and are inhabited. So that's the verse I was referring to. Yeah. And. I uh, that blew my mind because uh, I'm like, well, they're going to remember what it was like before before the kingdom. And they're going to look at that. and They're going to go. That, you remember what that place used to be like? Now it's like the Garden of Eden, you know. And, and the thing is, they're going to understand what it means to be like the Garden of Eden. Yeah. They're yeah. Gonna, they, they, they'll they understand God's original intent. Yeah. Yeah. And that that mindset. Yeah. Is is the thinking that they're going to have. And that's what he fills them with. And he puts that in their heart. And then they live out of it because the spirit lives. Do you think from that verse that they um, there will always be a memory of the past? Do you think that's possible? Uh, There had been some who said that uh, you know when we get the new heaven and new earth and God's going to wipe the tears from their eyes, no more sorrow. That there will be somehow we will forget the past or our past lives. I was about the former things pass away. Oh, I think you'll have a have a godlike understanding of the past. Right. So it won't be a longing for it or a regret of it. The, the problem with remembering the past is you you, you regret it. And there's I Yeah. I I say when I when I preach, I don't think I've ever finished preaching that I wasn't mad at myself because of the things that I didn't say. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well yeah. You, you always remember the things that you didn't the good you didn't do and the bad you so yeah. that's gonna be, you know, yeah. You'll be able to look at Robert taught, my wife taught this weekend at the, at the meeting, uh, in all things, give thanks. And I told her, I said, you know, we, we talk about that in all things right now, in this experience, you can give thanks. And we say, and Robert did Sunday morning, it doesn't say for all things, but there is a verse that says for all. Things. Yeah, it's in Ephesians. Yeah, there is both for and in. Right. Yeah. So how do you get where you can yeah. go through something and then be thankful for it? Well, that's that's Ephesians. That's part of the being filled with the Spirit. Yeah. Ephesians five. That's a. You have this bigger, mature outlook. You see that. You see how it fits in the big picture. Yes. And when you get to be able to see how everything fits in the big picture, then you can be thankful even for the fact that it happened. All right. Cynthia used the illustration of Bathsheba. Well, if you look in Matthew one, she's in the genealogy of Christ. She realized 
back in in it that she became a part of what God's plan for David was, right, and for Israel. So you you see all those things. You think you're thinking I'm not loud enough, right? Yeah, the yeah. Uh, the saints are like RJ is a little low. They yeah. they all want to hear you. I know. Yeah, I know. Well, I got my Bible. <laughs> they, I just happened to get my Bible. It's my time. fault. I should have gone wireless uh, for for him. Uh, no, uh, so right. he could access the Bible. I'll, I'll remember. I'll remember to. Um. Anyway, that's are you. Uh, I I am dying for you to get into Ezekiel 40, 41, 42, <laughs> all the way to forty eight. Yeah, I, I can't it, wait. I'm Pastor. dying. I'm, I'm dying when that comes to. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait, and I'm like, he's still in Ezekiel thirty six, man. I get. I cannot wait until we. Well, I'm going to tell you, 36 and 37 are going to take a while. <laughs> I thought you were going to do a chapter a week. That's what I thought. <laughs> well, I'm in 36, and we're in like the 64th or 65th study, which is pretty close to a chapter a week. And yeah. I, and I can tell you, there's a bunch of chapters I went through that I'm looking at thinking, there's no way I'm going to teach this in a week. And I did, just out of the discipline of saying, you don't need to be bogged down on the same thing every week. I won't, I won't put you on the spot about this, but have you? do you know, kind of have a general sense yet of what you might say about sacrifices in the kingdom? Yeah. Okay, that's all I need. I, I can wait. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 know what I'm, I know pretty much what I'm going to say. But one of the things, when I teach a book, first thing I do is read it at least 100 times, just read it. And then you keep reading it as you teach it. And... Those chapters, I've read them by themselves, <laughs> you know, but I've been doing this for 50 years, so it's not yeah. the first time I did it. Yeah. It's the first time I've taught it when now you're on the record about it. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to see what I have to say, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 38, 39, of course, famous passages. Uh, I think most people know uh, your views on uh, Gog and Magog, which are great. And I'm looking forward to, but uh, man, the, 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 the temple and the kingdom is just epic. Um, yeah. The, those, so, are, those are, do you, of course, there's more in, in those chapters than just the temple too. Do you so. think the prince is David? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Good. Well, at least I got one right. <laughs> and you, you, you know, you talk about chapter 38 and 39. I, actually, I've I've come to understand those passages somewhat differently, because first Russia's not involved. You got to you, you got to get rid of King James Bible to do that. But none of those nations are Palestinian; they're all away from the Arab nations. And usually, and I've done this: the ten the ten nation confederacy, like the ten toes and stuff. You identify that with uh, with Psalm eighty three. Yeah, it's, uh, exactly right. And Sunday, I, Saturday night, I, I I taught at the conference some things about. I've come to understand Psalm eighty three has got nothing to do with that. That's the Arab, those Arab nations around. And what got me started with that is the tents of the tabernacle of Lebe, of Edom. When I when I taught Obadiah, the, the Confederacy and Obadiah, he's talking to Edom, and he mm -hmm. says, "This Confederacy that that's got you." bringing you to the border so it's a, it's a land dispute and they're deceiving you they're using you they're not for you and so you've got the the tabernacle of eden they don't have a land they're at the front of that of that confederacy of people who hate israel that era those arab nations and then god destroys them in ezekiel 25 he says i'm going to use i'm going to destroy edom by the hand of my people mm -hmm. In Isaiah 63, Christ comes through Edom, who is this comes from Edom, from Bozrah. And he said, I, and I'm doing it by myself, mm. none of the people with me. So there's two different destructions of Edom. Mm. That one's the second advent itself. And I've come to understand Psalm 83 is before the 70th week. Mm. That's why in Ezekiel 38, those the cities are at peace, mm -hmm. no walls. Yeah. How does that happen? Yeah. Right. You know, that's always been a, a question. Well, if God, if he has destroyed, and the other part of that is right down the street, we pass coming here, this big Islamic temple yep. complex. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yep. They're not, and I want to pass it, I said, wow, that's a man, that's a monster. Yeah. They're not coming here converting Americans. They're coming here and gathering themselves together. 
up in Michigan, uh, Dearborn, Michigan, headquarters of Ford and so forth. That's basically 80% Muslim now because they, they, they settle there. Well, the what do you do about Islam? Well, Psalm 83 says at the end of that that issue, every, the whole world's going to know that Jehovah is, is the only God. In Zephaniah chapter 2, he says when he comes and does this, he's going to, as a great phrase, famish the gods. He's going to take away all their followers. And I'm, I've come to the conclusion that that's going to take place at the beginning and lay the groundwork where the Antichrist can can become the the big kahuna. But anyway, that's, so <laughs> my view of 38 is kind of, uh, that's a, a subsequent invasion. Uh, and it's not associated with the, yeah. the, the ten. You say you say big kahuna. People have been calling you that all this all this morning. Uh, yeah, Carl, but, I, but I've lost a lot of weight. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not that big anymore. Carl's like, you got the big kahuna on today, and I was like, yeah, the, today's big kahuna day. And in fact, I know Carl's got a question for the big kahuna. Um, but when you think about Carl, sorry, Pastor. When I think about Carl, I just I can't help but see him on that surfboard on top of that wave, and I'm thinking, oh, I know. There's the big nut. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Carl is, uh, oh, I, 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 I love that man too much, and he's very excited about you being here. And he's got uh, some questions here for you, I know. So let me get into the live chat. Uh, John Stongrass, he's had some health issues. He's been a dear saint with us for uh, quite a long time. Uh, and he says, uh, yes, Joyce, he sure has shined a light on uh, many topics that I just skimmed over in the past, but now is second nature, so to speak. And some guy named Joel, well, I'm going to skip that. Uh, thank you, dear brother, <laughs> for those kind words. Damon Chen, we all saw that, dear brother, this weekend. He says, good morning to our mad, bad crew and our saints. Speak the truth and love with grace unto the hearer in all things, for this is the will of God. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. And he says, Joel, my wife and I had a wonderful time fellowshipping with all the saints at the conference, and we're always excited to see Brother Jordan. Yeah, yeah. You and me, you and me both, brother. You and me both. Um, Norma Garcia is in the house. She's uh, kind of a newish member of our church. Uh, she's, a, she's her and Daisy. They're real blessings. Okay, here we go. Carl Coates, our dear brother. Greetings, Joel and panel, and the big kahuna. <laughs> Got a question for Brother Kahuna. Brother. The, <laughs> the book of Revelation. Is it correct to say the book is all future based on uh, 119? Many thanks. Yes. I love that question. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, let me read 119 real quick and then we'll. <laughs> not, not, not necessarily based on 119, just yes. Write the things which thou hast seen and the things which are. And the things which shall be hereafter, right? The, the, the famous structural breakdown of the book of Revelation. Uh, well, in some commentaries, uh, Bullinger really highlights this in his book. But the things which thou hast seen and the things which are and the things which shall be hereafter. Well, how would you exegete the things which are? The things that are probably taking place in that very moment with the Lord um, talking to him yeah. in that moment. Probably. Right to think right to things which thou hast seen. So he's already seen other thing in the book. So chapter two onward, he's already seen that. The things which are, write right what you saw. In other words, you saw it, now you write it down. And what are they? They're the things which shall come hereafter. Now the the Acts two way of doing that is the, the things which you've seen as chapter one, the things that are chapter two and three of the church, and then things that are after four four to twenty the future. But that's really not what the verses. That's a, that's a convenient. What you, you get used to reading a verse and thinking about it the way you've always heard it, as opposed to actually putting. And it's hard to put that out of your mind and then read it and try to make sense out of it without all the preconceived ideas. But when, when you do that, and to me, it was write those things which thou hast seen. Okay, then that, that's what started me on a different thinking path about it. Uh, I love that. And I'm pretty sure now I taught it wrong. Uh, Joyce says, uh, yes. Uh, oh, she's being real kind to me. Thank you very much, Joyce. It is a blessing to us to have you with us. It truly is. 
Uh, Sean Davis says, uh, I've been watching Richard's right division sessions from four years ago, and I find these to be the clearest teachings on some difficult things, such as Israel being saved and enduring to the end. Um, well, real quick, how, um, I'm guessing he's talking about Romans 11 there. Uh, so it is written, uh, all Israel shall be saved, as it is written. Um, yeah. You know, in Romans 11, and I, I'll just maybe just take a minute and talk about some things that, that aggravate me. Love that. In, in the book of Romans, when, when you, you know, I draw the right division chart, the book of Romans, it, chapter 15, verse 8, tells you the earth of the ministry of Christ. Mm. Romans 11, 11 tells you the book of Acts. Fall of Israel, salvation, going to the Gentiles. Romans eleven thirteen tells you where we are today. Paul's our apostle. Romans eleven twenty five tells you what the future is going to be. Twenty five, twenty six, twenty seven. So the whole book of Romans, you you've got the foundation not just doctrinally for everything. You've got dispensationally the foundation for everything we need to know. Mm. Yeah. Someone asked me <laughs> if you had if you could only have one book outside of your Bible, what would it be? Uh, it's be Romans. Well, outside of the Bible. Outside of, oh, outside of the Bible. Well, for me, it'd be treasure of Scripture knowledge. Mm -hmm. But if you only had one book in the Bible, what would it be? It'd have to be the book of Romans, because that's the foundation of everything. And even the things that the advanced things that you get in Ephesians find their foundation here. But it's always fascinated me. You talk about Bullinger, mm -hmm. Mr. Stam, Mr. Becker, O'Hara. The, the men that that laid the foundation for mid acts dispensationalism, and you know O'Hare was the guy. He was the, the gatherer, the preacher, the fellow that people. Mister Becker was the educator. Mister Stan was the guy that that actually did it. He 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 didn't just discover it, but he formulated it. He wrote it. And he defended it. His book, The Controversy, has every objection anybody will ever give you to mid act to the distinct ministry of Paul, and and that's. Again, this is just me, and I, I knew I met Mr. Stan when I was right after I got saved in Mobile. I'd known him since a teenager, and he he never really talked about mid acts. He talked about the distinctive ministry of Paul, mm -hmm. and that's for me. That's the right way to say it. Yeah, right. And because you're not trying to tag a place, he's Acts nine, clearly Acts nine. Oh, Heron Becker were thirteen. He used to. He told me that I was in a meeting one time and. He said they they set Mr. O'Hare up. He said, uh, "Brother O'Hare, when did the body of Christ start?" Acts thirteen, and and then he asked him something about uh, the Peter and so forth over here, and one of the Acts thirteen kind of little things that not no judging. And he said, "I punched Charlie." I said, "Why don't you guys get back over to nine where you belong?" <laughs> <laughs> so they they had a, a you know a, a, a friendly right. discussion. Right. Always had been, but he. He focused on that and his ministry. If you look at his ministry, things that differ, Paul's apostleship and ministry, the first volume of the book of Acts, the controversy, everybody ought to read those books. For year, for decades, I read the controversy every January because it brings you back to where you need to be in, in, uh, in, in understanding because, you know, your mind drifts through the year. And all those guys did something I just don't understand. They would say... The fall of Israel is only completed at the end of the book of Acts. Yeah. Officially through the end of the book of Acts. And I I'd say, I, I, I discussed it with him. He said, well, that's when you quit dealing with us. But that's not when they fell. The verse says, through the fall of Israel, salvation goes to the Gentiles. And if the fall of them be the riches of the world and the diminishing of them, uh, fall of them be the, rich, the, the riches of the Gentiles, so they fell and then they diminished, mm -hmm. and right. that that dimin But the fall it, never after Acts seven is Israel offered an opportunity to have right. a kingdom. Right. So right. they're officially done. Right. Right. He they diminish because if by any means I might provoke the emulation them which are my flesh and save some, he wanted to get some of those lost Jews in the body of Christ. Amen. So the care and and that's the explanation for. All the things that go on in Paul's Acts ministry that look that are Jewish is that they're a testimony and a, an attempt to win the, those lost right. Jews. They're not. Right. He's not carrying on the Jewish program, and that right. that that confusion point always just 
baffle me, uh, even after discussing it with them. Uh, the, how, explaining it as a fall, a hard break with the stoning of Stephen, and then a diminishing after the fact is the only thing that makes that makes sense to me. Yeah, but you, um, if, if you read, and he, and it, it it starts with Sir Robert Anderson. He he, I know people that believe he was actually the originator of the Mid Acts position. In, with the uh, silence of God, mm. and because he was a compadre of Bullinger, it's uh, it's you know you get to meet people. You read a you read Anderson an article by him, and he say, "Billy and I go to 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 so and so for a fortnight Bible study," mm -hmm. and you think, "What well, what it would have been Bully. a walk." Yeah, well, what would have been yeah. down walk down the street with those two guys? Yeah. Oh, I know. Oh, I know. <laughs> exactly. But he he had an understanding of of. Um, and I, I know people that say he was an Acts 28 because he doesn't put the final fall of Israel till Acts 28. Right. The thing that always confused me about uh, one of the big confusing points for me about uh, Acts was uh, Romans tw uh, Acts 12 with the uh, with Herod, what he did to Herod, you know, because I'm like, well, if the age of grace started and he's not imputing trespasses, why is he taking out Herod in Acts 12 of all places? But the diminishing and the kind of a transition period there is the only explanation that would make any sense yeah. uh, for me. Are, are you are you okay with that? Yeah. Are you, the the revelation of the of the of the new program is the diminished goes this way and it goes this way. Yeah. It's yeah. not all. Nothing is. The, yeah. But the the hard break where we're not going back. I don't believe Israel had an opportunity to receive her kingdom after Act Seven. Right, amen. And, right. That, and if you do, then you've got two, and that's Reading where the, the the hybrid stuff comes from. Um, the uh, okay, so back to the, back to Sean Davis. He says, "Saved, saved in Romans, Israel being saved and enduring to the end, uh, uh, as it is written, all Israel shall be saved." Uh, let me see here, down here at. Um, Verse 26, and so all Israel shall be saved as it is written. There shall come out of Zion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. Uh, that always bugged me growing up because I'm always like, well, what does this mean? Does this mean that all the Israelites are going to get soul salvation and God's going to, what, what's, you know, what's going on there? And, uh, um, of course, you got to ask yourself first, saved from what? Yeah. What kind of salvation are we talking about here? It's fast. Well, of course, when he says all Israel, he's talking about the little flock. He's not talking about apostate Israel. I, uh, I, I that it, distinction about what what does it mean to be saved? I don't remember the statistics right off the top of my head, but years ago I I took a concordance and took all the references to saved and went through them, and uh, probably sixty or, or seventy percent, if I remember right, we're talking about physical things. Physical salvation. Mm -hmm. Very few of them talking about what well, we think about. You know, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, I should be saved from, you know, mm -hmm. get eternal, eternal life. Mm -hmm. And we read that into even in Paul's epistles. You know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. That's not work to get eternal life. It's let the life work out it in you. But understanding that when you understand salvation, past tense, mm -hmm. present tense, future tense, justification, sanctification, glorification, that helps in that. But in Israel's program. And people talking about in, in Israel's program, do you have to work to get saved? Yes. But the salvation you're working for is it's a physical kingdom. You, there are physical things that have to be done to, to set up a kingdom. So they had to have physical things that need to be done to get that kingdom. Mm -hmm. And the only people that are going to do those physical things that, are, that get the kingdom are people that, have, that make those the works of faith. That you, have the, you have faith that produces them. If you produce them without faith, you wind up in the apostasy. Mm -hmm. And... So there's, you know, you get all these arguments about James two and Romans four and right. all those kind of things, and you are arguing about apples and figs, you know, not the same things. Um, love that. All right. Well, let me. Uh, uh, I hope. Uh, I hope you felt like you got your money's worth out of that, Sean. Uh, Sonia is in the house also. It's awesome to see you. What's going on? We've got Lourdes, our sweet sister down there in Puerto Rico. Um, she said, uh, good morning, saints. I heard for the first time of Pastor Jordan by Pastor Michael Miguel Ortiz, our dear brother. <laughs> um, I love I love me some Michael Ortiz. And uh, he's got a Spanish Grace podcast. 
so I, and I have a link to that beneath the video. So I would totally, um, totally recommend Michael. I love, I love that guy. Cliff Matthews says uh, totaled about 18 inches <laughs> snow, but layered with ice rain. So the sheets compacted it. Ooh. It was a, I think Cliff was talking about a place somewhere in Canada uh, yesterday that was like 70 below. Unbelievable. Yo, it's not going to be above zero in Chicago till after I get home. Oh, yeah? All the hot air <laughs> coming back up there. <laughs> yeah, my, my wife this morning, she says, you know, when we get to O'Hare tomorrow, I'm going to stay in the terminal and let you go get the car. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah. That's probably going to be a good idea. We've got 10 inches of ice on it, and I'm hoping the battery's not dead. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and let me see here. Uh, let me skim through the uh, – see if there's some questions here. Uh, um, uh, we got Larry and Colin in the house. How you doing, guys? Great to see you. It's a very picture perfect here today. The trees have a light snow covering, and there is a bright blue sky. That's uh, we got Frank Ledoux in the house. Hey, brother my brother, Frank. Frank Ledoux showed up. Ought to be. It ought to be cold in Wisconsin. Uh, yeah, yeah, twelve below. He says where he's at. They're a hardy people. Yes. <laughs> um. Uh, Mike Moriarty's in the house. Great to see all the bad saints online. And to those I got to see at the conference today on Martin Luther King Day, let's uh, remember that life is not about race, but it's about God's amazing grace. Amen. 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 Um, I know there's some questions in here. I think Joyce had a question. Hey, we got Chuck in the house. How you doing? Rick and Debs. Chuck. Awesome to see you guys. Chuyita is here. Um uh people are like you're killing me you're late i know that's all right i i do that every once in a while sharon mckinty's in the house mckinty i should say hello to everybody to love to all i'm snowed in here in tennessee uh put paul cook on the prayer list too please back issues okay we'll do uh paul cook uh joyce says hi pastor jordan i'll never get to meet you in person here but i feel like i know you because i watch back-to-back -back messages of yours daily yeah yeah what you see is what you get with pastor jordan yeah. that's for sure a lot of fortitude yeah, <laughs> yeah. See, that that demonstrates to you that it's the message that draws people not so much the messenger you um Absolutely. Um, now, you mentioned all, all my all time favorite writers, Baker, Stam, O'Hare. Um, and um, do you have a, can you list offhand some of your all time favorite Grace books ever? Um, I'm guessing the controversy is probably up there. Things that differ. I, I remember uh, January 2015 coming to my first uh, Jordan conference um, and you, you had stacks of things that differ on your on your tables and i thought that's amazing you know considering the fallout you're still promoting stam's books i think that's just i thought wow that's that's some grace that's really awesome he, um he, he, people are people but the message doesn't change yeah. amen and amen i mean there are things in that book i don't agree with but those things and some of my stuff I don't agree with too. It's a. It's been a long so, time since I read things that differ, and I don't. And I'm wanting to go back and reread it again, but I don't. Do you Do you remember what some of the things are that you might differ with in there? Does he talk about twelve in in that book at all, or he, he thinks he does? <laughs> um, he had an interesting. He, I got. I got thrown out of a guy's house where I was. I was staying with him. It was in a Bible conference. And he literally put me on the street because I told him, Mr. Stan, I believe the 12 were in the body of Christ. He said, he does not. I said, yes, he does. Oh, he yeah. said, I know I've read his books. I know he does. He does. He does. I said, well, brother, I, I know him. I work with him. I know he doesn't. <laughs> and yeah. the reason he thought he did is because things that when you finish things that differ, you could never think that he thought they were in. Now, he, he does say that, that but it does. When he talks about the 12, you know, we're going to reign on the, Matthew 19, 12 thrones, on 12, the 12, sit on 12 thrones, judge the 12 tribes of Israel. You don't think that's the body of Christ. Yeah. And he take, and this, this brother, I mean, he, he was, well, I, I had to wow. go find, I had to go find a place to spend the night. And <laughs> he was that, he'd misread the book that much. So 
the book makes you think. Everything it teaches it says no, but he did, he did believe that. And he had, Mr. Stam was the kind of guy that when I worked with him, I worked with him for eight years, he didn't like to sit and study so much, write a memo. Writing makes an exacting man, he would say. When he wrote his commentary on Romans, Romans 8, 1, he left the last 10 words out. Mm -hmm. I have a memo, a sack of memos that thick, back and forth between us, where we we argue the thing. And he he loved to debate. He loved to study. It wasn't a matter of it just his the methodology was you're more exacting if you write it down yep. because we always remember what you said, so yep. you're careful. Yep. And he was right. Well, and when I told him that about he he had a he had an article you should get it sometime about why the twelve are in the body of Christ. Got like yep. like ten or twelve reasons. And there are the reasons you have to deal with. He he was no slouch. One time, one of my favorite things was he got he was sick. He calls me up to his apartment. He says, now, Dr. Blair is going to come by, and he's going to put me back in the hospital. Sit down here. I've got 14 reasons why I shouldn't go back to the hospital. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I, I want to rehearse them with you. Wow. So, so he did. I said, sounds good. So... <laughs> When Dr. Blair came, I brought him up to the to, to his apartment, and then I, I leave, and I'm thinking, I'm going to stand out here in the hall. i got to hear this. <laughs> <laughs> so I, stu I stood down the hall. Ruthie was, was there, and uh, he, he starts, and he says, Dr. Blair, sit down here. And he's laying in the bed holding his head. I mean, he's he's room spin. And he says, no. And he gets to the third point, and Dr. Blair says, okay, okay. okay. Wow. And I know. Mr. Stem said, no, 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 I got more points. <laughs> <laughs> wow. He, he didn't get through all four. But I mean, he was that kind of a, oh, yeah. of a thinker. Yeah. And unfortunately, very few of his peers were that kind of thinkers, frankly, just in all honesty. But uh, his reasonings from the 12N were very, and in fact, very simple. And, and they were verses. And you have to have an answer for those things. And some of them really, you, you, your answer is my perspective on other verses. Don't let me think that. So uh, anyway, things that differ, something like that. The thing that bugs me the most is that, and this was true of all those early grace writers and still some, they were always looking for a verse, a, a version that would make the verse say what they wanted it to say. Oh, yeah. Right. And, the, you know, it's yeah. 15 or 20 different versions. Yeah. Versions that no. Yeah, it drives the, me the crazy. William, the Williams way. Who's ever heard of Williams? You're right. And so those kind of things. But most, it's so fundamentally, and when Mr. Stam wrote, um, he when he wrote the Romans commentary, or any of the commentaries, he, he didn't have computers. He would, he would, you type, and then he'd go back and change something, and he would paste over and type on mm -hmm. that. And you'd get a, you, the page, it'd just be full, every page had full of corrections. Mm -hmm. But what he would do, he would condense it. I've got a thing that's on my desk now that he gave me the editor's rule cut, 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 right. cut, 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 yep. cut, cut, cut. Yep. And exactly. He'd yep. say, Pastor Jordan, that's a little wordy. <laughs> I've been I've been accused of that, you know. <laughs> so I'm guilty. Things that differ, like I said, uh, the first volume. Things that differ in the first volume of the Book of Acts. Uh, <clears throat> you get those two books, and and you you've got you got it. Yep. The others were de develop it, mm -hmm. but those two books got it. Mister Baker's book, Dispensational Theology, is a is a good one volume uh, book. It's it's. Mr. Baker was different than Stam. When Stam was always writing, here's the point, I want you to believe it. Mm. Mr. Baker was more the academic, here's three or four different ideas, and right. you can't always tell which one he thinks. Although, I got to say, Baker always impressed on me. I mean, he was he was a master of brevity uh, when he was making points. on. He would, he would he knew every word was carefully chosen, and he once he made that point, he moved on, like he did in the Understanding series that he had. Yeah, uh, and I and I really admired his skill for that, um, and and even Stan to a large degree. You you read him, you know there's been a lot of editing. He's got he makes his point and he moves on. He doesn't linger too much too often. Yeah, Mr. Stan, he often said, "I'm I'm 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 going for their heart, not just their head," because he he had that. 
I got to yeah. convict them because I got to convert them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And Mr. Baker was like, so he's the academic. O O'Hare was the gatherer. Stan was the, 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 the defender and, and Baker was the educator. And those three men, you know, eternity is better for the ministry they've had. Yeah. Man, praise uh, the Lord. The, uh, uh, you were, we're talking about uh, the writers using different translations to make the point that they wanted to make. When I was, uh, Lori and I were on vacation, I read a couple of books on hermeneutics, and the books on hermeneutics were doing the same thing. Yeah. And I'm like, this is textbook bad hermeneutics. And one of the things about the hermeneutics that we, you know, we were, we've been chatting about is just that the, you know, how you view the text determines how you're going to interpret the text, you know? And so uh, bibliology wasn't just preservation or wasn't just it, revelation, inspiration, illumination, but we were arguing it's got to be preservation too, because you wouldn't, if it wasn't for preservation, you wouldn't know anything about any of the other three and you wouldn't even have a Bible. No. That's you true. Know? Yeah. I, yeah. Hermeneutics, you know, and of course I've read, you know, one or two books on hermeneutics. And oftentimes, to me, it's just an excuse not to believe something. Yeah. Um, it seems to me uh, you have a lot going on today, especially with... Um, I've seen a number of articles about subjectivism and stuff. People imposing their own views on the text, viewing the text through the prism of politics or whatever, rather than allowing the text to change your own thinking. And I and I I was saying on Wednesday nights, I think this is a, a, a an area in which grace a grace movement has been exceptional. You know, we were we the text comes first, and we allow the text to adjust our thinking from time to time. And we've just been so, and I mean, it seems to me grace is the last place where you can find exceptional hermeneutics. Um, I won't argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, all right. Uh, John Stongrass says, I don't have a question for Pastor Jordan that he hasn't already answered. If I didn't have uh, any, he gave me some, then he answered them, right? <laughs> and everybody else is going, yeah, same here. Um, uh, Sonia says, um, I wish I had been fully in right division before some of the donations I made to the wrong kinds of ministries in the past. Yep. Yep. Um, Ray and Debbie are fantastic folks, Carl says. Uh, John Snodgrass says, Pastor Jordan, the position or jobs we may receive in the heavenly places, are they determined with what we have done with Jesus in this lifetime, or are they preset by the Father? Doctors of Paul. The there former, you go. Hmm? The former, not the latter. Yep. Totally agree. Uh, we got Sandy Briggs in the house. Awesome to see you. Uh, Grace Believer 077 says, I'd like to thank you, Brother Jordan, for the message Friday night. Your heartfelt emotion at the very end was not lost on me. The uh, When you get older, it's, you know... Emotions are an inter interesting thing, he, and really, he, as I've gotten older, he, he, all of a sudden you have emotions he, that <laughs> that come out because he, he, when you're younger, or at least when I was younger, you just the emotions came afterwards because you just you're going through stuff so fast you didn't have time to do that, but. Yeah, occasionally. Oh, I, yeah. I, uh, I had a, it was common. The saints at church uh, had said, look, Joel, you did a good job Friday night, but you didn't stand a chance with Jordan going through the chart. That's historic. That was not that anybody's competing, but you, that after was I, fantastic. After I got through, like I said, that was fantastic. I'm thinking, you didn't do this and you didn't do that. Didn't do <laughs> what, what were you doing? You were, and, and it's. I was absolutely dumbfounded when I saw the how long it was, as I Yada said it was fifty minutes long. Right. Because looking at the at the crowd, they were. You know, they, I I gauge more by if people are going to sleep. Yeah. Or not. Yeah. So you hadn't put them to sleep. You'd kept them. No. Away. Well, and, and I. But it it was. It was not one of the chart nights that I would recommend if you. Never had I would absolutely before. recommend it. I would totally recommend it a, th uh, to a, a, a hundred times, a thousand times over because, you know, you were, it was a lot, there was a clear logical progression in everything that was happening 
all the way up to the end of the age of grace and then all the way into the end. It, it was there was it was clear. It was it was easy, easy to digest. It was great. All the verses were the best verses you could have used for those to make those points. And I just the logical progression was easy to follow. It, the whole thing was great. You were fantastic. Oh, well, it was and teaching to people that you, you the majority of whom you, you know already understand some of this. Mm. You can teach differently than if you're teaching to a crowd that never seen it. Yeah. And like I said that night, for years, I don't know, we used to call Friday night the chart, chart night. night. Yeah. Everywhere in all yeah. the conferences around because I'd be when people would bring people that didn't know. So yeah. you're expecting there to be people that don't know what's going on. So you, yeah. you're, you're getting bottom line coming up. The other night, I knew that it was mainly our folks there. Few, there was there were some few. You know, did you meet the young, the two young boys that go to Cuba? No, I didn't. No. And I'd say I can't think of their names right off the top of my That's head. That's all right. I've, I've got them. I've got them written down. But they they're going down to Cuba and they're going to have a Grace Group in Cuba. Oh, praise wow! Cool. <laughs> I said, whoa, wow! Okay. That's awesome. So, yeah, it is. Um, We've had a couple of young kids uh, uh, as of late. There was an Alex here, and then there was an Alex, a, a different a young kid also named Alex at the conference, and they just came into the message, and they are on fire for for the Lord, for the for the uh, right division, you know, Brother Jordan, all that stuff. They, uh, yeah, they it's they, really exciting they, to see the kids on fire about the absolutely. message. Yeah, it, it sure would. We, I, I, probably 65 percent of our group are under fifty. And it's wonderful to see young families. We got so many. His his daughter and my my son have four kids, three of which are teenagers now. Yes, I know. Amazing. All of which are bigger than me. I, it's unbelievable. But it, we have a number of families with four and five kids and three and four kids, and it's wonderful to see the zeal they have for 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 the truth for grace. Uh, it's wonderful to pastor a congregation of people who have some maturity in that regard. It's just, and when they're younger and they're way younger than you are, that's even, even because yeah. when I first went there, they were, I was the young guy and everybody's yeah. older. Yeah. But it, it's wonderful to see that. And it's wonderful in this meeting to see these young men. I, I met several people, younger people that I never met before that came just to say hello yeah. and see what's going on. I want to meet, meet you guys. Yeah. And the things they're doing and what they're doing. And, and, it's organic to them. You're not sending them. You're not telling yeah. them. The, uh, uh, in fact, uh, the one kid, uh, he's, you know, once he came into the message, he gets up at four or five in the morning. He's reading. He's gone through all the all the standard grace books we've, we've all gone through. And uh, and I mean, every waking moment is spent studying something that yeah. he, every free time stu to read something, study something and to learn more. And uh, I mean, now, I mean, you think of all the books of Baker and Stam and all the stuff that's out now, that's, uh, that's, you know, that, that takes some time to get through them all. Yeah. And there's a, and what happens at the natural progression, you, you learn here, then you build on it. And then you come in and you come here, mm. not down here. And that's, now that's one of the geniuses of Mr. Stam's book, things are different first volume of acts and controversy yeah. and yeah. Paul is Paul ship and ministry. They say everything you need to know about the distinction ministry of Paul, but there's still, I don't care who puts stuff up here. Those are things you still need to get. Yeah. And then you get, a, you get the level here and now you, you, you go and then that, that, that group, the next level up. So we're up here now, like three steps up and I'm, I'm in here and I see guys building up here. And I think, wow, the, the future is in great hands. Yep. Amen. Those kids are those kids know their grace message back and forward too. It's amazing. I think uh, probably the one probably the one caution I would give the the young is that they're so used to just taking in information constantly all day, all night. You need to stop and meditate uh, on the word and start to, and learn to develop those skills to think think things through on your own, comparing scripture with scripture. Would you be okay with that? Meditation. It's designed for meditation. Yeah, I, I would say that, and I, I would say get out on the streets with it mm -hmm. so that you – one of the things that if you're taking in and you don't do it in the context of – if you've got a local church, you've got people around you to do it, but getting out – when I say to the streets, I'm not, not literally, but but literally, get out and minute, put it out. Right. Talk uh, to people. Yeah. Yeah. I was fortunate – in the early days of my Christian life to all I wanted to do was learn and tell somebody. 
and and I, a, a dear guy, I I said, nah, you know, he said, look, every time two streets cross at four corners, if you're on one of them, three of them are empty. And I was mm -hmm. dumb enough to think, okay, well, I'll, I'll try that. But then you you know, working at the mission and getting it where you have a, an outlet for it. Because that gives you a perspective of of what it does and how it works, and to me the the, the living part of it, it, where you see it working, yeah, and the opposition that that gives you, yeah, and nothing makes you study harder than somebody disagreeing yeah. with you. <laughs> uh, would you still recommend street preaching? Yeah, yeah, we still do that. Yeah, you still do that. Yeah, what's well, uh, I, I actually. I'll tell you a secret that very few people, I don't tell this to people. Maybe I shouldn't tell you guys. I'll, I won't do it. We promise to repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be telling this story for years and years. Yeah. <laughs> for before COVID, I used to twice a year go down by myself, get on the old ride over to Oak Park, get on the old train ride into the city. And go to, go down if you know where if you know Chicago, Michigan Avenue, where the Wrigley Building is, there's a plaza, and go down there and preach. And then come home. I'd go down. You, you you could preach. You, you could talk for about thirty minutes, twenty minutes, and your voice gets out. I'd just go down, pass out tracks, and stand there. And it's an area where people do that kind of stuff. And just mm -hmm. and I for for all the time I've been in Chicago, uh, I would not tell anybody where I'm going, what I'm doing. Just go down and do that. Just for, just for the kicks of it, just, just to kick myself in the rear end and say, get it into gear, Rick. Because mm -hmm. you know you're off here, you're working in an office, you're working this thing, you're doing these things. Your people are saying these things about you. Go down here and let let the let the world spit in your face. Um, you uh, uh, what? No, uh, do you what do you say when you hand out the tracks? Do you, do you have like a specific spiel? Like, uh, hey, do you want to know how to get eternal life? Do you know? Do, is Would there you like to not go to hell today? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I'll send you. And they're like, "Well, I'm already in it, am I?" He, yeah. he, I'd say, "Here, let, 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 let me let you have that." Really? Yeah, that's I, what you'd say. Yeah, here, here, let, 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 let me just let you have that. He, I was he, when we first went to Chicago and at the North Shore Church, he, which was in very, very bad area of Chicago, North uh, Uptown. I I would go around at Montrose and. Belmont and uh, Montrose and uh, something I can't remember now, but it was it was a real straight walking area, and I'm sitting there passing out tracks and talking to people, and a cop pulls up, and he says, <laughs> he said, rolls this window. I said, what are you doing? I said, I'm letting people have one of these. Let's <laughs> have. And he says, son, what are you doing? I, I'm 33, 34 years old. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm from around the church. I'm going to pass these out. And he says, has anybody asked you anything? Bother? I said, well, that, that kid over there, every night he comes over and says, what do you want? I said, I want to give you one of these. And he says, you see that woman's down the corner over there? I said, yeah. I said, what do you think she's doing? I said, waiting on the bus. He said, sit down here. See? <laughs> <laughs> Let me introduce you to yeah, yeah. really well, old he, service. Yeah. He, well, the the kid is. He said he, he. You don't know where you are. You need you you're, you you need to understand. And he educated me. He said the kid is a runner. He says, "What do you you know? You come here, you stand here. He and and if you say I, I want drugs or I want gambling or I want a woman, he knows where to go. He's the runner. Oh, okay, that's interesting. The woman, well, she's a prostitute. Well, I'd never seen a prostitute before, and so I didn't know that was what it was. So anyway, I'm I'm thinking, okay, this is interesting. This is this is sort of like mission work because you know when I, yep. did, when I worked at Skid Row's in the Mission Mobile, they weren't quite that sophisticated. But Herb Brill had a had a from the church had a a a, a little youth center up not far from there, and so I started going up there. And a young boy, couldn't have been more than 15 years old, I, I, I'm trying to talk to him, and he pulled a wad of money, big old wad of money like that, $100 bills. He said, that's the only God I know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Stuck yep. it right in his pocket. Yep. And I, I said, Herb, what in the world is that? He said, he's a male prostitute. Mm -hmm. You know. And mm -hmm. he said, wow. 
So that was a side of life that when you came from Alabama, you hadn't really seen right. condensed, oh, yeah. concentrated that way. But, and you don't have to get in that kind of situation. But the idea of getting out among lost people and sharing the gospel with them gives you an appreciation for what you really are teaching. It, right. it quits being just theology. Um, the uh, I remember when we flew up, I flew into O'Hare on uh, last July. I am somewhere near where you get to the buses, I think, or something. There's there was a, there was a table of maybe Jehovah's Witnesses or something, and I thought, man, I would give anything for a table at the airport where the departures, the arrivals come in and just give them all the tracks. That would just be amazing. You just have to do it. Yeah. You get permission. I guess it's possible to get permission to do that, but that's a lot of people. Uh, Mike Moriarty says, uh, put in a plug for Cynthia Jordan's message. She shared at the conference, all the men should listen. It was very edifying and learned some things I never knew or ever thought about. Um, she, she was really surprised when the, the lady from was it Zambia, <laughs> Really yep. wrote a note to her. Yeah. <laughs> what are people in Zambia listening to me for? How did, how did, <laughs> how did they hear that? Oh, well, they do. My wife is not someone who desires to teach like that. She's children love her. She loves children and she works with them hand and foot. Her conviction at, at Shorewood is that she should be the last one out of the building. Every time we, we go, we leave. She's a servant. She serves. And to, to teach like that, she's, totally capable of doing it, but it's not her first choice. Yeah. So when, mm -hmm. it, when, it, when uh, she gets that kind of response, it kind of throws her. Uh, Frank Ledoux says, Audi brother Richard had been many years, uh, met you in 1985. Right. We're still doing pal talk on Monday nights with Greg Reeser, Ron Keeble, and Robert Barnes. Yep. They've been doing yeah. that for, for ages and generations. Everybody in the world thought Pal Talk was over with, but they 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 keep it going. They keep it. Going. Yeah, I would have I would have said the same. I would have not not known about Pal Talk had it been for <laughs> Frank Ledoux and his group. Um, I tell you, and, I I do appreciate those guys. I mean, Frank's been with us from the very beginning. Yeah. I mean, he's still there. Greg, big, and uh, of course Ron. And you know, you, guys like that that have every reason in the world not to be with you. Mm -hmm. to quit um, to quit and they don't quit right right and they're or l they're a real rebuke when you think you ought to quit that's, that's right. right uh anita uh anita's in the house she had um she had some heart surgery and uh was still uh still in michigan so ha wasn't able to join the conferences here but she says hello right, gary anita. smith says awesome awesome <laughs> um and i know joyce had a question down here um Chuck says, uh, Richard Jordan, um, Chuck says, Richard Jordan, what is your belief on healing and the baptism in the Holy ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues? <laughs> what is my belief about it? I believe it belongs to the nation of Israel and yep. it, wor it works in their program. It doesn't work in ours. Amen. Uh, healing, uh, was, uh, the, the healing that the Lord did would foreshadowed life in the kingdom. The, the, the coming of the kingdom, uh, the deliverance of the Messiah from the sin curse and uh, the, the, the being in the bondage to the power, under the uh, power of the devil. Uh, baptism in the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. That came in real handy at Pentecost. It sure did. <laughs> <laughs> and, and both of them, and it's interesting, those two, those two signs. That's the first signs he gave Israel uh, in Exodus with Moses. Uh, healing, put his hand in his bosom, came out leprous, put it back in his heel, takes the rod, puts it down, it becomes a serpent, handling serpents and, and uh, the, the healing. Because that's the two, and, and Jesus goes about in Luke 8, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, healing, casting out devils. Right. Uh -huh. What's he going to do in the kingdom? He's going to cast the devils out. Zechariah chapter 13, there'll be no more evil spirits in the land. And he's going to bring He's going to bring the, the curse of sin, uh, of physical uh, sickness, and do away with that. Right. He's going to restore life in the kingdom. And those are signs that, that what he says is true. The Jews require a sign. They need they need that evidence. So those things are there. In the dispensation of grace, God isn't, isn't trying to reclaim our physical bodies. And uh, 
personally, I don't believe God heals today at all because it's not a necessary thing. Uh, we've grown and travail and pain together until now. I, I had a debate one time on a radio with a charismatic preacher. Really? <laughs> and, he, and he, oh yeah. And he, he was talking about the healing and stuff. And I, I quoted Romans 8.22, where we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth and pain together until now. He says, that's them. I said, but, but wait, I didn't finish. And not only they, but we ourselves groan within ourselves. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Waiting, Waiting for not for you to heal me, but for the redemption of my body. That's what my hope is. Amen. And the fact is that he was, I was in my probably 40, and he was probably 55, 60. I said, the fact is you've got grunts and groans too. And, and the reason you're wearing the glasses you're wearing to read your Bible is because your body's wearing out. And you talk about healing people. Well, physician, heal thyself. Right. Come on, let's exactly. get it done. Right. And, and of course, he got a little, a little offended by that. We love to point out the. Uh, I remember uh, first year of the podcast uh, during the lockdowns, we were pointing out that uh, there's a uh, healing church in California that's popular called Bethel, and they have a university on healing, a school of healing, which was closed because of COVID. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and I need to say too, just just to be kind. One of the one of the things I discovered among grace people is that, okay, we don't believe in miraculous healing, but we still believe God heals people if we and, and answered our prayers. And I, that also has gotten me into trouble for not believing that. And so I I recognize it that, that there's something about physical. And Fred's gone through. My wife, when I say I'm hurting and groaning, she says, shut up. You don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> Women know something about pain than men yep. don't. Fred probably knows more about it than any man I know. Physical pain. But we all want to get rid of it. You mm -hmm. know, I, you, you, nobody wants to hurt physically. But the fact is that even in, in, the, in, in the physical pain, in all things give thanks, there's a rejoicing and with, with, there's no growth without suffering, so you 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 endure the things and you, you take it away. Then you took away the opportunity for tribulation to work. So I don't think God does that. No. But and and when when you get sick and the first thing is oh pray that I get over it. Well, why don't we pray that in in it? Right. Because that's where you, Amen. there's going to come a time when you don't get over it. Right. So anyway, there's the God's grace in it. Back in the the controversy days we, we we put out an album fred will remember this we call it the grace alternatives yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah six different guys taught taught on different topics and uh one of them was you know the the, the physical the physical healing issue and like i said it it uh you you find out that just understanding right division isn't enough it's the place you start right but if you don't get the grace life part of it, the living part of it, and that's the reason I said get out with stuff, get get the doctrine right. out into life. If you don't do that, the growth that the understanding is designed to produce in you, in your inner man, doesn't right. function well. Right. And uh, and you've got, you know, I'm sure everybody in grace would agree that, you know, especially like Second Corinthians 12, the emphasis in Paul's epistles is empowerment from within especially the sufficiency of his grace to be able to endure with joy and to glory God for everything he's done for us. And in fact, I, I would probably argue that the greatest testimony you can have is the suffering servant glorifying God for everything he's already done, despite the pain and the problems you're going through. That's a pretty powerful testimony. Yeah. That's what, what he is. He's the suffering servant. That's a good title. Um, Let's see here. The part I had trouble with in Corinthians when Paul was going through that was the most gladly. <laughs> most gladly, therefore. Well, see, that's the, the not not in all things, but for all things. All that's right. right. <laughs> uh, Sandy Briggs says, there's nothing like grace school of the Bible. Nothing. I normally have very little retention or recall nowadays, but not so with grace school of the Bible. I'm forever grateful for Pastor Jordan. I came into right division uh, via Pastor Jordan. A lot of people would, would say that. Um, I mean, often we'll hear uh, people coming into Grace, uh, they sometimes stumble into it online, either Feldick or Pastor Jordan. Uh, they're the two most popular names we get. Um, you know, Les has a, his TV program, 
was actually the best thing that happened to our pro our TV program. Our, our, the, the program we have that follows him on Saturday is the most productive program we have. The ones that follow charismatics, they say, well, what's that? Yes. The one that follow Les, they say, hey, that's what Les was talking about. Mm -hmm. and, and then you, get, you, go, you go into it a little, little more in depth. He has such a gentle spirit about and, and such a ability to teach at the level that, that the viewers are, certainly that I don't have. Uh, Chuck says, if you want the truth to go around the world, you must hire an express train to pull it. But if you want a lie to go around the world, it will fly. Mm -hmm. yeah. It is as light as a feather and a breath will carry it. Yeah, that's, that's good. awesome. That's good, Chuck. Uh, Mike Moriarty says, my uh, favorite saying that I first heard from Brother Jordan that really changed my life was Jesus Christ gave his life to you so he could give his life to you gave and now you. live his life through you. Right. Um, Robert Craig's in the house. How you doing? Favorite RJ quote, as mixed up as a termite in a yo-yo. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, let's see here. Um, that would be what people remember. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, Sandy Briggs says my favorite Richard Jordan quote is you don't have to tell mama everything. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's good advice. Yes. Yes. Uh, Hey, we got Salem Baptist in the house. How you doing? No school today. Tuning in from Northwest Georgia. Awesome to have you here. Um, did you guys have church yesterday at Shorewood? Do you yep. know? Morning and evening. Wow. Uh, by, by the way, it, uh, it is Martin Luther King's holiday. That's today. right. Last night, Alex taught. And listen, Alex Kurz is an absolutely fantastic Bible teacher. Amen. He's my associate at Shorewood. I'd listen to him all day long and just be happy to have him do it. I, I couldn't be more, more thrilled and honored and privileged to have him as, as the, uh, my, my other part. And he taught a study last night on the curse of Cain. Did he? And it was just absolutely fascinating. Huh? He, he, the way of Cain and how he, the, uh, works-based idea he, he, carried on since he, the days of Cain or no, no, I, I said the curse of Canaan. Oh, Canaan. Or Canaan. Genesis, oh, Genesis forgive nine, me, no, forgive no, me. I'm sorry. I said Cain. I, I, I was wrong. And he he explained, he said, he, he, we, we encourage our folks to read. We have a thing in the book to read through the scripture. And he said, you know, I've always had this question about why did Noah curse Cain, Canaan? Hmm. And so he said, I asked myself six questions. He wrote them down and then he explained them. And then he then he taught about it. And it was just an absolutely fascinating uh, study. And since that passage is often used to justify segregation, racial segregation, I, I thought it, I just that made me think about it just then. Uh, I'd recommend you go to shorewoodbiblechurch.org and look up the uh, the archive and, and, and get Alex's study. If you, if you just want to go through the passage in, in a way that explains, you know, what 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 the issue is, examines it honestly. The pastor, he's, t he's, he's teaching Matthew on a Zoom meeting on Tuesday morning. And it is absolutely some of the most perceptive studies on Matthew I've ever seen. And again, uh, you, 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 you get this, here, here's a foundation that he has that he builds on. Mm. He's, he, he's not repeating the foundation. Yeah. He's building on it. Yeah. And it's just absolutely perceptive. And and I just sit there and just glory. Yeah, the thing about Alex I love it, is that too with him you can see a very clear logical progression that's easy to follow until so you, until he gets to presenting to you the big picture what he wants you to know, and he's and and it's and it's um it's wonderful to see somebody people do that in grace for me. So I he's so and and in that respect I also love his tone and the way he is when he preaches. Absolutely, he's not talking down to people. There's, there's a, you can tell that there is a loving spirit with him that you can, you know, approachable, accessible, a great, you know, um, there's, I, I could, I could go on for a long time about the things I love with uh, uh, Alex, but especially the, the hands, you know, the, the snake hands. Sometimes he does the roller coaster, you know, 
the, the hands are my fa- and my favorite thing with Charlie McQuillan is when he does the personations of Alex with the hands. It's just so funny. Um, you know, Charlie is a, he's he's a hoot, mm-hmm. and he can impersonate everybody. You, you, yeah, with he he nails you like nobody I have ever heard. It's, yeah, it's he, he had me on the floor. My wife is. She's out there somewhere with your wife, but they left. They did. So you can speak freely. I won't make any jokes about them both being out there at the church one day. (laughs) Charlie's in the media room, which is right next to my office. Mm. He's talking to some of the guys and he, he, my wife is at the, in the hall and I'm, I'm, I'm not even, I wasn't even in town and he does the, Hey chick. (laughs) (laughs) i think i've heard that story actually she thought it was (laughs) (laughs) completely (laughs) oh man he he uh uh, i was at brian's house one time and he did impersonation of you and i just i i fell on the floor laughing and then he impersonated me and then you cried yeah i cried i cried (laughs) yeah that's right um, uh, so we got Denise in the house. How are you? Um, it's great to see you. If I missed an earlier quote, I'm sorry, I, I couldn't find it, but uh, I am convinced that nothing in this life will separate me from the love of God, not angels, not the present, nor death. Thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice on the cross and for saving me and for forgiving me. Amen. Amen. Love that. Uh, now is the time for the sign next door. Oh, yeah. God, God loves God you. Get loves used you. to it. Get yeah. used to it. That's great. <laughs> we love that sign. Uh, Joyce says, I love Pastor Jordan's Ezekiel study. I wish he would uh, do one on Zechariah. That book is fascinating to me. He already did that. Uh, okay. I guess we'll have to check that out. Joyce had a question. Who's the man with the measuring line in his hand in the book of Zechariah? Is that the, um, uh, with the what do they call it? The zip line? No. <laughs> The what? Not the zip line. That's what they. That's what you ride on. See, the mistakes are daily, brother. That's how stories get started. Oh, uh, what's it's the it's the thing that you use with the bubble to get the make sure it's even the wall and the. Um, We're not going to help you out, brother. Just keep floundering. Yeah, just keep going. Uh, yeah, uh, Ricky Kurth has a great article on that. I think that's <laughs> it's, the, it's where the law, the wall is leaning over, and you're using that thing of a bob. The plumb line. Thank you, thank you. Yes, uh, the plumb uh, line. That's it. It was just getting embarrassing. I had to. But, <laughs> but then, but the 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 point is, the Paul the wall usually falls over in the direction it's already leaning, right. which I love. That was his great point. So I don't know. Is that even is that even in the book of Zechariah? No, uh, that's not in Zechariah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to stop now. Okay, so the measuring line in his hand in the book of Zechariah. <laughs> that's, it's Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 2 is where it's at. Um. All right, Zechariah chapter 2. Let me, I'll get over there. We can read that. Some uh, Zechariah 2, a vision of a man with a measuring line. Uh, it's that whole, probably the whole chapter, uh, all the way down to verse 13. Yep. Um, Look, behold, a man with a measuring line in his hand. Verse 2, then said I, whither goest thou? And he said unto me, to measure Jerusalem to see what is the breadth thereof and what is the length thereof. And behold, the angel that talked with me went forth, and another angel went out to meet him and said unto him, Run, speak to this young man, saying, Jerusalem shall be inhabited as towns without walls for the multitude of men and cattle therein. For I, saith the Lord, will be unto her a wall of fire round about, and will be the glory in the midst of her. Ho, ho, come forth and flee from the land of the north, saith the Lord. That sounds like Santa Claus. Yeah, it right. Does. That's Chris. <laughs> For I have spread you, uh, spread you abroad as the four winds of heaven, saith the Lord. Deliver thyself, O Zion, that dwellest with the daughter of Babylon. For thus saith the Lord of hosts, after the glory hath he sent me upon the nations which spoiled you. For he that toucheth you toucheth the apple of his eye. 
That's a beautiful thought. For behold, I will shake mine hand upon them, and they shall be a spoil to their servants, and ye shall know that the Lord of hosts hath sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for lo, I come, and I will dwell in the midst of thee, saith the Lord, and many nations shall be joined to the Lord in that day, and shall be my people. And I will dwell in the midst of thee, and thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto thee, and the Lord shall inherit Judah, his portion in the holy land, and shall choose Jerusalem again. Be silent, O all flesh, before the Lord. For he is raised up out of his holy habitation. Wow. The uh, references to his second coming are kind of hard to, hard to uh, miss at the end there. That's beautiful. So the question is, who was the man with the measuring line? Right. It was an angel. Right. Um, verse, verse number two and three. So it would seem like he is, he is judging the uh, Israel itself in light of his return, like the kind of along the lines of, you know, them being uh, servants, keeping watch, obeying him until his return. And he's sort of going to judge the quality of their works, maybe, do you think, or? Yeah, he, he's identifying, you, you measuring the city. This is my city. Mm -hmm. um, that was awesome. I really enjoyed that. Thank you, Joyce. Uh, and Chuck is pointing out a lot of whosoever uh, verses I noticed in the Gospels here. John 3, 16, whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Would you say that whosoever uh, means whosoever, Pastor Jordan? <laughs> yeah, I'd probably think I'd, I'd probably agree with that. <laughs> probably means whosoever. Yeah. Um, and it's, there's Jesus Christ said whosoever, right? Well, and you have um, you have for example, I mean, Jordan went through this on Friday night at the at the conference of the chart and made the point uh, that we often make is that the, you know, the the program with the Lord was certainly the conversion of the Gentiles, but it was through Israel. Uh, and that was the end game was always the Gentiles, and it was through Israel. Um, John 4, 22. And there were times when Gentiles did get saved under that program, like the thief on the cross. But it's not like the thief on the cross was up there going, yeah, I'll bet you, I'll bet you Christ is he's in the process of paying for all my sins, and he's going to be buried, and he's going to be resurrected the third day. I think they just he just believed who he was. Well, I said, remember when you come into your kingdom. Yeah. So you know, well, so he had he, some knowledge he, he there, un didn't he? Understood yeah. some of the program. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, he, Christ, what Christ did in his ministry wasn't behind closed doors. You know, it was a rather public kind of thing. Um, yeah, actually, when you think about what that he said about Christ, he said, you know, he's a just man. He did not not like us and so forth. He had to, he had a lot of knowledge about about who, who he was being crucified next to. All right, so let's see here. We've got another comment here. Cutting up the Word of God. I'll bet you that's Chuck's wife. What would you? What's your response to that, Pastor? What's that? Cutting up the Word of God. Right division. Right division, right. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, the idea that all of the Word of God is to you, about you, and for you uh, is really hard to make work. Uh, considering uh, everything that's said to Israel, about Israel, and for Israel. Are you an Israelite? Um, Romans 11 teaches that uh, Israel's been set aside for a reason and for a season, so Herod would say. Uh, well, the, so word, the Word of God cannot be broken, but it can be separated. And it can be rightly yeah. divided. Right. <laughs> and when you divide it, you want to do it right. That's right. <laughs> if you're going to do it right, you got to do it God's way. Right. And the problem is that we, we so often we do it man's way. And that, that's the reason, you know, we talk about the chart. That, that's where that came from. It's just trying to, the two passages in Paul's epistles where he lays out his understanding of how God's programs work out. So why not use, since Paul tells you to write the divide, why not use Paul's way? Mm -hmm. It always made sense to me. So, Well, and there's, a, and there's another distinction there, uh, Chuck, with John 3.16, is that during the Lord's earthly ministry, salvation was, you had, to, you had to believe that Christ was the Messiah. But for us, it's different. You have the death, burial, and resurrection that's part of our good news, which nobody could have comprehended dur during the days when the Lord uh, was alive. The disciples didn't even understand what the Lord was meant when he said he was going to die. He, they, had, they had a hard time even believing that. Well, John, John 3.16 is not really about it. 
John 3.16 tells us salvation is by faith in Christ alone. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Now, salvation is by faith in Christ alone. That's why the verse works today. It's not, a, it's not doctrinally about mm. us, but the application is certainly, mm. uh, you know, something that is in line with what Paul teaches us, Romans 4. <laughs> Now the, um, the, so well, I, I don't get as I don't get as bent out of shape about John three sixteen as a lot of people do. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when uh, in John three sixteen, when he says God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, do you think in that in that gave it's implied his sacrifice also, or is it just merely his incarnation and allowing him to come as the Messiah to the people? Well, well, the verses right before it. When you when you look at them, he's talking about Moses lifting up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness. So must the Son of Man be lifted up. Right. Yeah. So the, the giving in in the context, and the the question to me is, did Christ say that or did John write it? Right. And that's a great. That's the the question really the controversy because in the book of John, he'll start. You come along, then all of a sudden, you, well, that's that's. That's John writing, right? He's quoting Christ, and the question comes in 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 the verse uh, thirteen: "No man has ascended, no man has ascended to heaven, uh, but he that cometh down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven." So the the standard view is that Christ, that John Christ is no longer talking there. If he is, that's a great statement on his on his. Mm. on his deity, which personally, that's why I take it. But, you know, you, everybody doesn't do that. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must son of man be lifted up. That whosoever believeth on him should not perish, but have eternal life. For, that's the, let me explain what I just said. Mm. So God so loved the world. So in the, in in the context of the thing, it's you know it would be if Christ said that, then it would have to be in the context of verse fourteen and fifteen. And that's not just that he came into the world, but he came for a purpose. Right. Now, how much of that they understand? What the, when you look at Moses living up the serpent in the wilderness, that kind of thing, you can read into that the cross but it isn't necessarily there yet. Right, right. You, can, you know, I, I, I taught a thing. <laughs> I'm going through Ezekiel 36 piece by piece right now. And, and like I said, it's going to take a while. And when he explains baptism in Ezekiel 36, 25, which to me is the verse that explains water baptism, I'm going to sprinkle you with clean water that you might be purified from all your, the filthiness of your idolatry. Well, where do you get clean water? The old joke about holy water. How do you make holy water? You Burn the hell out of it. Boil the hell out of yeah. it, yeah. Well, how do you get the water purification? Well, that's the, the numbers 19 with the red heifer. Mm -hmm. You take the, the red heifer. It's red, okay? It's a heifer. It's a, it's a female. You say, why is, it, why is that a type of Christ? Well, that's the conduit of life. Has to be without spot, without blemish, no no yoke on it. All about him. You, 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 when, when we look back, we said that's him. Oh yeah, without a doubt. Yep. You know, so they don't know that. We now can look back and see. Yeah. God knows what He's going to do. So He puts a type that that when it comes over here, you say that's it. Yeah. And the, and you you burn, you sacrifice it, then you burn it, and you have the ashes. You don't have to go re-sacrifice it. Right. The ashes are, are the memorial of right. the sacrifice, the value. and then you mix that with running water. There's there's the 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 sacrifice and the spirit, the word of God working in the spirit, and that makes pure water. So you look at all that; they didn't know all that. We look back now and know it. Yep, exactly. So yeah. there's a lot of typology that uh, you, when you see this stuff and you know what we now know or even what the, they knew in the book of Hebrews, what explains it, I, I go, wow. So when I see something like that, or John the Baptist says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Well, everybody goes, oh, he knows the cross and Calvary and stuff. Well, nah, we now know that. that. Right. 
We know more than what John knows. I, I love, I did a sermon once on red heifer. I love that. I loved studying red heifer. I, you know, Israel, because Israel today is they're all excited about they're bringing in red heifers into Israel now. True. And you've, I've seen videos of, of, uh, uh, Jews with magnifying glass looking over the red every mm. inch that makes sure every <laughs> hair on that heifer is red, you know. And and I mean, who wants to be that guy, you know, yeah. having to and 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 I remember uh, when who, I was prepping who wants to be the guy that finds the blonde the blonde hair on the red heifer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because it had to be a pure red, red heifer. heifer yeah. Every hair had to be red. And uh, I just remember, uh, uh, and and I, I remember at the time I was prepping for it. I said, "Well, I wonder what Jews would say about the numbers 19." And they're like, "We have no clue what's going on in these. Why God would have us do this? We have no idea." And it's like, how can you not see Christ in so many ways in that whole purification process? It's amazing. It's amazing. I love the red heifer, and I love that a section when you went through it over the weekend. Yeah, yeah, but you just have to remember that we know it now. They didn't know it then. No, that's right. No, and, and that's like in the book of John. Even if John was written late, which you know, I don't believe it was, and I'll show you why. If you look at we're in chapter five. People say John was written ninety ninety five A.D. because no, some, I, John chapter five. There was there is at Jerusalem. A sheep market. If it was written after 70 AD, it said there was. Mm -hmm. There so you it, go. See, that verse was written before 70 go. AD. I had never considered that. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so, that's a great point. Yeah. So that, that now we just threw out all the idiocy about the book of the Revelation. Right. Been written late. Right. Book of John been written late. Do you, uh, One little verse does it. Do you think, Paul... Uh, wrote the last book of the Bible in the in terms of chronology, or do you think he just completed the puzzle in the sense of just putting the last piece of the big puzzle in the Bible? And yet, yet there were other writers who came after him. Do you have any thoughts on that, Pastor? I don't carry the way. My personal, private, individual, subjective opinion is that he wrote the last thing. Yeah, and then when he put the pen down in the second Timothy, it was over. Um, do you think that uh, there was the, when Paul, what was it, his first apostolic journey, the Holy Spirit presented, prevented him from going into Asia. Uh, do you think that had to do with uh, John and Revelation and the seven churches that were in Asia at the time? Or do you think those are future churches? I take the Revelation to be future because that's, okay. that's what the, the verses said, things hereafter. I think that he didn't send him up in there because of the of the the circumcision believers. Yeah. Okay. But I don't All think right. it's the seven churches. All right. Very good. I love that. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, let me see if there's any other. Uh, John, Chuck screaming, "Whosoever is whosoever." That's right. We would completely agree with that. Amen. Um. All right. So, uh, Dave uh, News Unit says, if the gospel of God is a different gospel than the one Paul preached, then why does he mention it in 1 Thessalonians and Romans 15, especially as the gospel he ministered to the Gentiles? Because it's not it's not a different one. <laughs> You're just saying that. <laughs> well, I, I really you, wish you'd get to the you, point, Pastor. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, Be direct that's right. for a change, yeah. will you? Yeah. He, he, yes. I, I am absolutely amazed at the tomfoolery that I see and I, I don't we, I shouldn't be unkind I should be nice and sweet since you guys love everybody we, we do um, we actually do yeah well okay good <laughs> <laughs> deeply I I can deeply love people and 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 viciously or ferociously or fiercely disagree with them there that's right that's, that's right, right. And be able. the idea that the gospel, the gospel of God, Paul explains to you what it is in Romans chapter one. Yes. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, which was made. So the gospel of God is about the Lord Jesus Christ. Who is he? He was made of the seed of David, according to the flesh, mm -hmm. declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection of the dead, by whom we have received grace and apostleship for the obedience of faith among all nations. The gospel of God, the good news of God is that God promised a redeemer. Amen. Genesis 3.15. Right. 
all through the scripture that God's good news is, and the Redeemer becomes Jesus Christ, becomes who is the seed of David, who now is also our Savior. In verse 16, he talks about the gospel of Christ. The gospel of God, that's, where it, that's whose good news it is. The gospel of Christ, that's who the good news is about. Amen. Right. And the gospel, and it just, it's like there's two different God. No, the, the gospel of God is that God sends a redeemer. And when Paul preached the gospel of God, he was preaching that God sent a redeemer. Who is he? He's Jesus Christ. When did Paul ever say the redeemer is anyone other than Christ? Right. So, the, and by the way, that distinction that gets pounded about the gospel of God and the gospel of Christ comes from the Acts 28 position. And it comes from people who sometime are in the mid-Acts view who are assimilating. There is a view that has developed over the last two or three decades. Uh, one brother called it a hybrid view. It's Acts 9 slash 28, where you have Paul in the book of Acts not preaching the dispensation of grace. The dispensation of grace doesn't begin until after Acts 28. And you're trying to put those two things together. And that, I said earlier, that what that is is an attempt, a failed attempt, as far as I'm concerned, to explain why Paul does things in the book of Acts that are part of Israel's program, mm -hmm. speaking in tongues, the water baptism, the uh, and so forth. But that's because of the diminishing of Israel. Mm -hmm. In Acts chapter 7, with the fall of Israel, salvation is sent to the Gentiles. Israel's program's over as far as a functioning, ongoing program. It's there. He doesn't, I don't think he takes those circumcision believe puts them in the body of Christ in the new program. Their program diminishes away, finally dies out. That's why the gates of hell can't prevail against it. But anyway, I just. I love, I love I, that, I, Pastor, and forgive me for not giving you eye contact. I was just trying to ask, okay. I, look for questions here for you. I, lo I loved what you had to say, brother. I, I. I catch myself. I can start teaching about it and preach about it, and then I, I stop. So, well, wait a minute. We're, I know it's going to be twenty after uh, we're, twelve we're, here. We'll we're, we're on we're on the love everybody podcast. That's right. We were, uh, we were that's right. Everybody. Love everybody podcast. That was the second title we were going to go with. If we uh, uh, it was either Grace Life or Love Everybody. <laughs> by, by the way, he, I I did have something I was going to talk to you about. I just remembered. Uh, I don't get to listen to the podcast very often. When I do, it's recorded because in the mornings I'm, I'm not that's good because i'd be terrified be really nervous <laughs> most of the time and, <laughs> and i saw you had russell on the other day russ shepherd such oh, a wonderful guy wasn't yeah. he great and i and I, I mentioned to you that uh you know he talked about brother wilson watkins that's right mm -hmm. and i told you that's he's the first african-american pastor i ever met that believed in internal security yeah and he he he's i would I just, I'd love to let you have Russell talk about him the whole, the, you know, about his ministry the whole time. Yeah. But he, he, the reason I knew Russell was going to be on it, I saw a piece of maybe 15 minutes of, of one that you did earlier, and you guys were talking about help meets. <laughs> and I, he, if you here can't it comes. hear the hyphen here it in comes. that word, yeah. he, he, there, there's no hyphen in that word. No. There, is, <laughs> there is no word in the, in the Bible. Called help me. Yeah, he said that the other day, and I'm know, like, I, I'm like, do I, I do, do I pull my Bible I out? What do I do? I'm not going to correct. There's no way I'm correct. I'm not going to fight help. with Jordan on this. There's no me. way. It's two words. That's the point. Yes, yes. It took me a minute to catch that too. I'm like, I, I don't. I, 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 there's no way I'm pulling my Bible out, and I'm going to correct him. <laughs> well, <laughs> so so let me explain to you what's going on there. Yeah. It, this is not a title that you that you saddle your wife with. You're my help meet. Right. Whatever that's supposed to mean. You're my help meet for him. They meet for him. That's what if you're going to connect meet with something, uh, connect I it with see what for you're him. Saying. Yeah. And I now I'm a, I love that. I did. I I I love that. That is fantastic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You're right. It didn't click with me. Yeah. Um, so here's the verb. There's what. It, yeah. It, now what that is, it, you have a left hand, you have a right hand. They're opposites, but they're meat for each other. Yeah. They work together. Yeah. J. Vernon McGee had yeah. the best explanation of that verse I ever heard. I love that. He said, "She's your mirror." I love She's, that. Uh, yeah. Your hands are your mirror. Yeah. Your opposites. 
but to mirror images. Yeah. And you, you don't try to make her, you're, if you're the right hand, you don't try to make her the right hand. You're glad yep. she's the left hand yeah. because you worked here. I love that. And, I love that. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. Okay. You got that. That's good. I'll <laughs> you could probably tell the other day I wasn't, wasn't clicking with me. Yeah. I was, I was cold sweat coming, starting to form because I was like, there's no way I'm going to tell Jordan he's wrong. <laughs> uh, Norma Garcia, who is the Spanish person? Uh, Miguel Ortiz. Miguel Ortiz. There's a link beneath the video to his uh, Spanish podcast. Uh, and I had him on the podcast uh, uh, once uh, also. We had, a, we had a great time. Chiita says, I agree with right division because it's biblical, but when does it become hyper dispensational? Uh, every time Mike comes on, <laughs> Mike's the most hyper guy we know. Uh, let, let me show folks what you're supposed to do with water. Drink it. <laughs> I, I, I thought we sprinkled, right? No? Uh, okay. We drink it. Um, you're getting a lot of love here when, when from you the can't Saints. Get Dr. Pepper. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Dave, Dave uh, Campbell, a uh, blast from the past, Petra. Uh, why should the father bother? <laughs> I remember that song. Yeah. Um, you like Christian rock, don't you, Pastor? <laughs> <laughs> About as much as I, <laughs> I, I, I I You know, in all honesty, I like most any music that's, that's good music. Rock music is a degenerated form of classical music, and I don't really appreciate degenerated forms of music. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> country music is a degenerated form of, of old folk music, and most people know that you know my music genre runs more into the Ray Stevens kind of thing, where he yeah, makes, oh, yeah. uh, he's always yeah. making fun of everybody. Yeah, so. yeah. I um um, isn't he the one that did the was it the Beaver thing? It's Squirrel. A, the squirrel that came this, into the sure. wasn't this Ray Stevens revival? Because yeah. that was because the uh, there was there was one year Lori and I were watching uh, your a conference. I don't know if it was a July or an April conference, and they sang this squirrel song of coming into the auditorium, and I laughed my head off. It was that was hysterical. The the frustrating thing about getting older for me is that nobody knows who. It used to be back in the 80s, Fred will remember, I, I'd quote him all the time. Everybody mm -hmm. knew what it was. Mm -hmm. Now I can quote him. You, you remember the, the commercial, you wonder where the yellow went when you brush mm -hmm. your teeth with Pepsodent. Right. Now you remember that. Oh, sure. You probably don't remember it. I quoted, I, I said that a couple weeks ago on Sunday morning. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I actually stopped. I said, how many of you don't know what I just said? How many of you? Two hands went up. Yeah. Yeah. And I said, my wife said, you know, you got to quit quoting things that nobody knows what they are. You think they, I said, well, you know, I'm sorry. I'll explain it next time. <laughs> <laughs> but the, the humor uh, for years and years, not so much now, but for years and years, I used to, you, you get up, you get a little, you need to get your blood circulating. And I'd play a little Ray Stevens and mm -hmm. that'd get me going. But the, uh, yeah, I, I I like I like most any kind of music if it's if it's real. Uh, most I spend most of my time listening to uh, like soundtracks to movies and things, you know, other instrumental um, stuff. Uh, that's great for great for study. Uh, John B's and and if I have not broke music is good for study. Huh? Broke music. Broke. It's, that actually studies have been done that demonstrate that people that have broke music in the background really uh, actually learn at a, at a better pace. Really? Um, John B's in the house. Uh, he, he talked about a good looking panel and I'm, I'm like, well, uh, we, we've all got the face of radio. What, what channel, yeah. what channel is he on? <laughs> he doesn't watch much TV clearly. Yeah. Where is uh, he at? Well, <laughs> We'll tune in right after we check out here. Um, yeah, that's uh, that's awesome. Yes, um, thank you. And I appreciate everybody, all the other comments. I'm just skimming now to see if there's any other big. Uh, uh, Helen is in the house. How are you, sister? I've been set free learning right division. Amen. Amen. Raised Catholic as a child, charismatic, and now I learned right division. I don't degrade people because you never know who will come in. We, I that's would never right. degrade anybody. Um, speak the truth in love, and then if they get hysterical, walk away. Um, the, you know, sometimes people think you're you're doing it when you when your your intent isn't just because you disagree with somebody, right? Actually, 
if you love them enough to tell them the truth, even if they don't necessarily think it's a thing to do, that's not, you're not hating right. them. You're not, you're right. not, and some people do it out of, out of just pride and arrogance, but that's, that's on you. And, and it seems like there's, some, there's this lost art of having a civil discourse while disagreeing and, and, and turning to the scriptures and just having a civil discussion about two different points of view and working through that, you know? Um, so that was one thing we had tried to, uh, try to model somehow. I try to get Fred and Hal to debate something and, uh, uh, and they're, they're always so gracious with each other, even when they disagree. It's, um, it's, it seems to be a lost art form. Uh, Me and Hal, or who's he talking about? <laughs> yeah, well, no, the, I just know. Uh, lost the, art form. I, yeah. Yeah. The, uh, yeah, that's what people when Hal and I, I mean, believe it or not, there are some things we don't agree on. And, you know, we can talk about it without yelling at each other or anything. No threats, but you know, I, you, I can remember times when we were yelling at each other, hollering, fuss, just going at each other. Mm. And then none of us didn't like each other. We just making a point. We used to have summer conferences. We'd have all night Bible studies. We'd have 15, 20 guys there studying and, and they'd get to arguing they would. and yelling and back and forth, making the point. And there was no animosity in it. It just was the zeal for your point. Amen. Yeah. Amen. And it wasn't a, 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 a mad kind of thing in the sense of being angry no. with one another. Passion. And, um, and to me, when you can put up with that, that's, that's a point of, you know, of real value and a, and esteem for one another. Amen. Uh, Helen says, I've never, I never knew about grace as much as I learned faith in the charismatic church. I never knew about grace and I'm so thankful. And I feel so much better now that I don't have any condemnation in Christ. Amen. Amen. That is fantastic. Um, uh, saved by grace is in the house. Our sweet sister out there in Germany. Want to mm -hmm. say thank That's you right. all for helping me yeah. understand right division. Watch the amazing conference. Greetings to you all, Helga. Awesome to have you here, Helga. It's great. To, it's great to hear from you. Um, all right, let me see if there's any other questions here. Uh, John B says I would have expected that the charismatic Christians would have been down the local mortuary raising the dead. It didn't happen, and rather than this, their so-called churches closed down. That's right. That's right. Um, Amy Stewart says his grace is sufficient to help yeah. us through any suffering. Um, um, uh, grace Believer says, I miss the spit fire on the pavement thing he used to say way back. Spit fire on the pavement. Yep. Uh, Son Sonia says, I love Les Feldick's teachings. He taught me right division originally. I've heard that from a lot of people. I used to listen to a lot of charismatic TV preachers and stumbled across them. Thank God. Yeah. Several less felt people in our assembly. Less, less send a lot of, uh, a, a number of people to our church and uh, they're awesome people. I love, I love them dearly. Uh, okay. So I'm getting to the plumb line thing. Sue Fitz, Fitzpatrick's in the house. Good to see you. Yes. All right. Let me see if there's anything else here. Uh, Jordan, it is, Absolutely fantastic having you here. Um, Jesus, uh, Mike Moriarty says, uh, Jesus Christ's death, burial, and resurrection is history, but Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection for my sins is eternal life. You Thank go. you very much for that, brother. Uh, Uncle Pamela's got one. Baby question. Genesis to Acts is to Israel, Romans to Philemon, to Gentiles, churches, Hebrews to Jude, to Israel, Revelations, both. I'd say you got it down pretty pretty well. I'd say that's uh, uh, that's fantastic. Um, let's see here. Uh, Mike says the key to growing in grace is not to judge the messenger, but to judge the message. See for yourself if the message lines up with the word of God. That's awesome, Mike. Thank you very much. Um, the uh, the comments are just pouring in here. Everybody's can't excited about them. having you can't here. Yeah. Uh, Chuck asked, "Was Jay Vernon McGee a right divider?" Acts two yeah. guy. He was an Acts two guy. He's an Acts two dispensationalist. Ah, oh, Ted Fellows is in the house. Hey, brother Ted. Your beautiful brother. So awesome to see you. 
Amen, now, brother. That's, Ted. that's one of the brothers is almost almost responsible for most of what we've done. Mm. Ted's the guy that came. He and another brother were well, the two that came and asked me to train them that's right. for the work of the ministry. Mm. I love I love that man too much. Yeah, and listen, Ted's right now on Facebook. He's been writing a bunch of stuff. Absolutely outstanding. Oh stuff. yeah, I got what I got one of his articles on my Grace News uh, group. Uh, that was awesome. Very when, excited about you, that. When you talk with him, ask him about the first time I ever saw him. Uh, was this he, the bike? He, Motorcycle yeah. thing? Yeah. Yeah. I may have heard this story, him uh, being on that motorcycle and uh, with his wife, Sue. Sue. She was on the bike with him? Yeah. <laughs> well, Sue's head and shoulder taller than he is, so she's behind him looking over his head. <laughs> <laughs> they ride up the they ride up the parkway at Cedar Lake, and I'm thinking that this is what grace people in the Northwest look like. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Ted's doing a fantastic job too on his YouTube channel. I'd give him a ton of love and uh, watch all his videos and subscribe to him. He's just fantastic. And Bill Barron's also is wonderful. Bill, see, can I advertise uh, Brother Greg Reeser's radio? Yes, yes. yes. One of the things I do for exercise is I walk. And in, and not right now, but in, when it's below zero. But in in the spring, summer, and fall, and I do it in the in the morning, late morning. And I listen on my device to his radio, to the uh, the radio station. And most of the time, when I'm listening, he's playing one of Brother Ted's radio programs and one of Brother Russell's. So I get to listen to Russ and Ted. Yeah, he, yeah, and, he, and I just, you know, just a thrill to me to hear these oh, guys yeah. teach. But uh, it's wonderful how that 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 asks. I have uh, beneath the video, if you click show more, I have a link to Greg Reeser's uh, radio, uh, Grace Radio Station, Grace Messages twenty four seven. How can you not love that? Um, um, the uh, is there anything else you'd want to promote? Um, I'd say uh, follow up uh, Shorewood Bible Church. Uh, follow Pastor Jordan and Alex and and check them out. They have a phenomenal library there. Um, Grace School of the Bible. We've got links to that beneath the video also. Yeah, okay. we got the Daniel commentary out now. It's in print, so that's available. If somebody wanted to get that, where would they go? To the, well, they can call the office, 888-535-2300. That's a school Great. number. Okay. And they can send it to them. Uh, they can look up Shorewood Bible Church or Grace Impact. Dot org is a school website. Yep. yep. Great. Uh, look those things up. But that's all oh, they can call you and get it from you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Call me. Hey, yeah, I'll way, take it. He, I, here's a little book I can recommend. Oh, hey, man. man. You know, man. I, I told him once, he, he's a little wordy. <laughs> but uh, identifications, my, uh, that is my, that's just my, that's all right. No, that's all we're about. That's good. Uh, the next one that has, <laughs> looks better that way, anyhow. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the next one's. Uh, I can I, I can recommend that if you're gonna write another one, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the next one is uh, if you know just how do you live in light of who you are, and just do nothing but application and leave it at that. Uh, so so, uh, so I, I do read these things and and I do see what goes on. I just don't do it live all the it's time. It's a it's a huge honor to have you here. It truly is, and I've I've seen I've known, your face I've again. I've been counting days. We've known Brother Fred and Hal since the early '80s, yeah. when they actually when when they started fellowship back yeah. back in, in in that day. So go go way back. Been been through a lot of ups and downs and here, here, ins and outs and so forth. I mentioned being thrown out of a guy's house. We've been thrown out of a lot of places, but we we didn't quit. And Fred hadn't quit, and the saints sure haven't. So I appreciate the work of the ministry and glad to. I'm glad that you they've developed the maturity to be able to put up with Joel. That's right. <laughs> That's true. So Ted Fellows says it wasn't a Harley. Uh, hey, uh, no, I know it wasn't a Harley. It was it was a race. It was a rice burner. A rice burner. Yeah, his motor, his motorcycle, a Japanese yeah. motorcycle. Um, uh, hey, you want to give us the gospel real quick, Pastor? Sure. One of the one of the great things about God's word is that it 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 uh, it tells you the truth. God knows you, and you know yourself, and it doesn't tell you anything about you that you don't really know. And when when Paul writes, the wage of sin is death, the gift of God's eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. 
that, that's a verse that just encompasses everything about us. What, what you earn, what you deserve because of your failures, your sins, is death. That's physical death. You're going to die. You know that. But it's also, you're not just a physical person. You're, you have a, a person inside of you that you know you have. I'm 76 years old. And inside, I feel like I'm about 28. And you know that, that kind of experience. And if you're young, you, you, you will know it. So you know there's somebody inside of you. And that's where the second death comes in. And the second death is to be is separation from God. Uh, Romans chapter 1, Paul says, the, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who hold the truth and unrighteousness. And, you know, when we think of the second death, you think of the lake of fire and that kind of thing. But the thing that makes the second death death is God isn't there. You're separated from God. Depart from me, you cursed, in the everlasting fire. The issue isn't the fire. The issue is being separated from God. And that's what sin does. And sin separates you from God right now. Alienated from, alienated from who God made you to be and the one who made you. But the gift of God is eternal life. Now, how can God do that? God commended his love toward us. And while we're yet Christ, sinners, Christ died for us. There's a sign out in front of this, right up the street from the church I mentioned a minute ago. God loves you. Get used to it. You might not want God to love you, but he does. And there's nothing you can do about it. He already did. And Jesus Christ, when he went to Calvary, he didn't go there as a martyr. He didn't go there as a religious uh, founder of some institute. He went there as a payment for your sin. He took your sin on his soul and his body and made his soul a payment for your sin. He died for you. And when he died for you, he paid for everything that's wrong with you. All the things that you don't want anybody to know about, all the things you don't tell people about, all the things you fear about, you worry about, you stress about, he died. He took the penalty for all of that, took it completely and totally, and he took it out of the way. And when he hung on that cross and said, it's finished, it's done, done deal. That's why three days later he could come forth out of the grave alive as a testimony that the, the payment was completely full. If, if there was one of your sins that wasn't paid for, he couldn't have, he couldn't have been raised from the dead. So the resurrection is like a receipt that says paid in full. And now he can take your, your death, take it out of the way, take your sin out of the way, give you forgiveness, give you peace with God. Peace is not, you know, peace isn't, well, we're not fighting right now. Peace is all the reasons to fight are over with. It's a cessation of being against somebody. You can stop people from fighting and they're still mad at each other. God isn't mad at you anymore. Now, you might be mad at him, but he's not mad at you. You have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's, that's God being able to declare you righteous and then give you his life. And that's, that's, the, that's the, the side of the gospel. You have forgiveness, complete and total acceptance. And then he gives you his life. And that life, you see, getting rid of death is one thing, but dead people can't do anything. So he gives you his life. He puts his life, and the gift of God is eternal life. Now, that lasts forever, but it doesn't begin when you die. It begins when you trust him. So the moment you trust him, he takes your sin away, gives you forgiveness, acceptance, blesses you with his life, and that life then begins to live in you. And now you can live the Christian life. Salvation begins at a, at a moment in time, at an instant. When you trust the Lord, you make a decision in your heart, to say, I'm going to rely exclusively upon the Lord Jesus Christ to be the Savior he died and rose again for me to be. That instant, that moment, you pass from death to life, out of Adam into Christ. That's something God does for you. You can't do that. I can't do it for you. Preacher can't do it. God does it. And that, then, he, then he gives you, in Christ, he gives you his life. And then that life, we're talking, we're talking about studying the Bible and doing all that stuff here. That life, the life, Jesus said, the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit of their life. He puts that life in you through his word. And then as you come to understand that word, you grow. You're a baby, you grow to be an adult. You drink milk, you go to, go to eat meat. As you mature, as you grow in that spiritual life, that's what the Christian life's about, is growing, that growing to maturity, to adulthood, and, and, and the ability to serve. Then one day when you go to be with the Lord, he comes to be with us. There's a ministry that all through eternity for us, but it begins now. So the key is to trust the Lord Jesus Christ personally, exclusively, right now.
And when you trust him, he gives his life. All the darkness, all that darkness, all that stuff that, that, that haunts you, like a, like a hound chasing after you, your past, he settles it, puts it under the blood, says you're forgiven, you draw a line, now have a new life. That's the good news. The good news is life in Christ Jesus. Paul said, for me to live is Christ. And that's, that's salvation, not religion, not trust in myself, trusting him. Where you are, you don't have to move a muscle. You don't have to pray. I tell people, you don't have to do that much. If you had to do that, you'd never know you did it right. All you'd have to do is trust the Lord Jesus Christ. That's a decision you make in your heart. So if you never did that, right now is the time to do it. If you have done it, now is the time to take his life and grow with it. If you have a question, listen, if you've got a question about that, something isn't clear, Put a note in in in, in the uh, in in the live chat, the, the chat here. There's there, there's ways to communicate with these brothers. They'd be happy to sit with an open Bible with you for the rest of the day till you got it clear. But you don't need us; you need Him. So trust Him. Let Him be your life. Amen. Uh, one last question: The Saints were asking who published your Daniel book. I think it's self-published, isn't it? We did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, hey, Pastor Fred, you want to? A uh, word of prayer. Sure. Would you Would you mind, Father? It is just a great day to fellowship with the uh, with the saints, like precious faith, to be able to uh, have a time of study of Your Word, and uh, just the rejoicing uh, that we can have with one another. And we pray as we continue throughout the rest of the day. We We know there are many requests that we uh, have from. Uh, other believers, we have those in our assembly who are not well, and so forth. We pray that today they'll be able just to rely on who they are in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and we give you the praise and honor and glory for that. And we pray these things in the name of our Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for coming out. Thank you. Well, I appreciate you guys and what you're doing. So. Uh, I appreciate you and what you're doing, Pastor, <laughs> what you've been doing for years. I uh, thank you for everything. Praise the Lord and pass ammunition. <laughs> That's right. Amen. On that note, have a bad day. Take care, guys. Bye.